Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet at the John Campus Show. Coming from right here on my YouTube channel, I am, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies, movie news, TV and streaming, CNN Plus, and all sorts of stuff. Sitting over here, joining us today is the one and the only Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. Robert, how you doing today? John, I'm doing good. I'm kind of sad that Chris Carr actually... You know, being a professional voiceover artist, she has a professional voiceover session because I think we're going to be saying for why a lot on the show today. Yes, there would have been many for why. Uh, I, I, I think been we're, we're going to have to we're going to have to do our best, John, to say for why the way Chris would deliver it. We will soldier on in we, her name to get this done. Uh, sitting over here, of course, joining you guys in the live chat. He's the biggest Halo fan in the world. Ray Orr is here joining us. Ray, how you doing? Did you see that episode last night? I haven't seen it. I'm going to watch it today. I'm going to watch oh, episodes four and five today. Oh, my God. Was it good? <laughs> wow. The action in it was awesome. I'm I thought so it was so glad because I, I, I've i been wanting this. I've been wanting you to enjoy this. I know you love Halo so and much. It was like 40, 35 minutes to 40 minutes of just action, just bonkersness. It's and all you loved it. The, yeah, because they brought out all the, the, the enemies I wanted to see, the little grunts and the jackals it was awesome um story wise i couldn't get i couldn't care less about it <laughs> <laughs> but the action was really good well, I, I gotta watch I, it. I gotta watch episodes four and five still so i'm gonna get caught up in that and of course uh chris carr is not here today of course she is a professional voice actress and she had a session to do today so she won't be joining us and then she's leaving tonight for texas going to a baby shower she's going to a baby shower in texas so chris won't be with us tomorrow either but don't you worry she's then hopping on a plane and flying to meet us in vegas vegas baby we're gonna vegas, be like swingers Woo! we're gonna have a good time in vegas this is gonna be you me ray chris aaron we're all going off to vegas for we're gonna Thigma be a 400 by midnight on monday i i i intend to be i know right you always play you go play the poker i love i like going to vegas with you that first time because my nights were free because you're like, okay, Rob, I'm off to the poker table. I'm like, yep. go with God, son. You know, me and and our buddy Soul, we went and and sister, we went to Vegas uh, three weeks ago, and I went and played at um, the Win. I won four grand in Dude. my first night playing there. Four That's grand. What Daddy's talking about. I'm now, gonna go play a little blackjack. Hopefully, I can channel your greatness. Yeah. Here's the thing, though. The next night, I thought. I'm practically a poker pro. Uh oh. So I decided to go and play at the big boys table, oh. thinking that I'm so good. You are. Yeah. Within about two hours, I lost like 1,100. And I'm like, I am clearly the worst player at their table. I'm going to go back to the kitty table. Bye. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I got a good spank in that night. But, but yeah, you still, you still left good. up. I left up, yeah. You know, that's that's the key in Vegas. My dad, for my 21st birthday, my dad took me to Vegas for the first time. And before that, he taught me how to play blackjack for like three weeks beforehand. He gave me 20 bucks and said, make me proud. I came back four hours later with almost $500. You know, you know how I'm staying away from any money or losing money? I'm bringing my Xbox with me, baby. <laughs> it's gonna be in. He's gonna be in. The Sorry, Rob. Xbox. I know me and you are bunking together, but it's gonna be all night. Xbox, Xbox baby. Well, wait a minute. You know, I've got an Xbox X. I've never unboxed it. Should I bring it with me too? No, 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 no. I have a little monitor that attaches to mine, so we. I'll just bring oh, so an extra controller play by yourself. I'll just bring an extra controller, just in case you lose and come back to the room early. I could bring my own controller. Oh, or yeah. Well, so we are going to be talking about CinemaCon uh, here. We're going to be giving a, a preview of all the things that are coming at CinemaCon next week, which is exciting. We got a lot of stuff to talk about here, guys. And this is how today's show is going to go. We're going to break it up into two parts. In the first half of the show, we're going to talk about some predetermined topics. Then in the second half of the show, we're going to take your live comments and questions. Now, if you'd like to get a live comment or question on, number one, you got to be watching live. Uh, and then we're going to open up the Super Chats once we get uh, near the end of the final main topic. We'll open up the Super Chats and you guys can fire them in. Now, listen, I'm going to let you know, Super Chats have been getting full within about two minutes of us opening it. So be ready. Try to maybe write out your Super Chat in a notepad or something first. Be ready for it so when we open it up, we can get yours in. All right. A little bit of house keeping here, guys, before we get started. First of all, I want to remind you guys that if you need your daily fix of the John Campion Show, but you can't be in front of, say, oh, a YouTube video, maybe you're jogging or you're at work or you're at the gym, good news, 
There's the audio-only version that we simply call the John Campy Show podcast. That is available on Apple Podcasts and all your favorite podcasting apps of choice. Go and subscribe to it there. But we also have two other podcast feeds. We have a dedicated podcast feed for Movie Club. We, of course, just did our last episode on uh, Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. You can go and check that out in all the episodes, all 11 episodes of Movie Club we've done wow, so far. 11? We've done 11 now. Isn't that crazy? Wow. That is nuts, right? So that's there. We also have a dedicated podcast feed just for Mailbag. So if you guys like listening to Mailbag, go ahead and subscribe to that podcast feed as well okay guys with that down let's get into a couple of off the tops here shall we and the first off the top we shall start with is this now let's go back a number of years rob back to when we heard that there was going to be a batman entering the dceu and the questions abounded about who's gonna play batman and one name definitely nobody guessed was Ben Affleck and then they announced Ben Affleck and the whole world laughed at it and I remember Rob me and John Schnepp the day they announced Ben Affleck John Schnepp and I we got on a live stream that day like literally within about 20 minutes of the announcement and we told the world you wait he's going to be a great Batman this is a great choice everybody can laugh right now but they won't be laughing later because he's going to be a great batman and the fact of the matter is he was a great batman in my opinion my favorite batman so far and even a lot of people who didn't like batman versus superman and didn't like those movies even a lot of those people really like ben affleck as batman but we have found out like obviously with any role rob there's going to be other people in the running one of the people who i didn't realize was in the running is now coming out and talking about a little bit but a guy that was very close to getting the role, and, and it came down, I believe, to between him and Ben Affleck, was Josh Brolin. Josh Brolin was up there to be their pick for this role. And I had no idea about that. Now, when you understand, this instantly made sense to me. When you understand that their goal was they were going for what Zack Snyder wanted was a more seasoned veteran and, and gritty, maybe a bit jaded Batman. Brolin would have been a really good pick. Now, this comes to us from CNN. They wrote the following. Josh Brolin says that he would have been an older and more raspy Batman than Ben Affleck. During a recent uh, conversation on the podcast Happy, Sad, Confused, which they do a lot of really good stuff, uh, Brolin said that he lost out on playing The Dark Knight to Ben Affleck. Director Zack Snyder went with Affleck as Batman in 2016's Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice, and Affleck also played the role in Snyder's Justice League film the following year. That was his decision. That wasn't my decision, Brolin said of Zack Snyder's pick. Uh, that would have been a fun deal, Brolin said of playing Batman. And maybe uh, I'll do it when I'm 80. Uh, he has done all right for himself, though, recently, of course, appearing in the film Dune. And, of course, he played that little MCU villain, Thanos. And Cable. And he played Cable. So he's been doing all right in the he's comic book. He's got old Josh Brolin. He's and now he's got right. some sci-fi western. Yeah, what TV, name outer of range, again? man. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, but I've had a bunch of people writing into me and talking to me about I, it. I, 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 apparently, it's two episodes out. Now. I can't wait to see. It. I've always, I mean, dude, he goes all the way back to the Goonies. No, he does. He's much younger, Josh Brolin, back in the Goonies. But I'll tell you what. Sometimes we look at these could have been castings, and we go like, "Whoo! Thank goodness!" Like because we got who we got. And again, Ben Affleck is my favorite Batman, but. This would have been a really cool Batman, too. Josh Brolin playing that role you could, also would have been great. What do you think about all this and the fact that he lost out on it? Well, you know, I mean, I could see Josh Brolin. They could have done a live-action Dark Knight Returns. He would have been awesome. He would have been needed to be a little older. Well, no, he would have. He could have started out, you know, and, and age up a little right, bit in the right. role and then come back because he's got that Dark Knight Returns jaw. Um, I like the idea. I like I like I like Josh Brolin. I mean, dude, he's so good in Sicario, and uh, he's such a badass. And I've I've really enjoyed his personas. Yeah, he had a little little rough patch there, you know, but uh, I really like where he's at now, and I'm a huge fan of his. And I think, look, man, I mean, even though he's a purple giant CGI titan, you still see Z uh, uh, Josh Brolin's face in Thanos. Yes, and he was great. He was great as Cable. I mean, I'm a huge fan, and I think he would have been a great Batman. Now, that's not to say Ben Affleck wasn't, but if he, he absolutely had, was, yeah. yeah, and if he had been in that role, I think he would have been even more brutal and more, as he said, raspy 
and it would have worked great. But I'm kind of glad. You know, I don't know if if him and Henry Cavill would have looked as like I loved seeing Henry Cavill and Ben Affleck meet at Lex Luthor's party in Batman v Superman. They kind of square off. Yep. Bruce Wayne and Clark Kent. I love bringing people <laughs> together. You know, whatever. I love that scene. I don't know if Josh Brolin would have been the best foil for Cavill's Kal-El. But I, it all worked out great. You know, uh, another thing he could have been really great for would be, he would have been a great Thomas Wayne. Like, when if you look at totally, the Flash, dude. Flashpoint story, like, what happens if Bruce died in the alley, but the dad lived, and that dad was Thomas Wayne, who went on become to become the Avenging Knight? Like he he could have fit in pretty well that with that, been right? Badass, dude. I would have liked that as well. Yeah. It, anyway, it guys, been. question is for you. Josh Brolin's talking about man. Hey, listen, that wasn't my decision not to be Batman. That was Zack Snyder's decision. I'm glad it went to Ben Affleck, but I mean, I think Josh Brolin would have been a really interesting Batman as yeah. well. What do you guys think? Do you kind of wish he had been it? Do you think he would have been all right as it? Do you think they made the right decision? Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comment section below and leave your thoughts there. All right, guys. With that down, let's do a second off the top, and that's this. Guys, you may remember, Ray, I know you do. Rob, I know you do too. But a little while ago, we did a story talking about how Dwayne The Rock Johnson came out and said, I just signed a deal to bring a beloved video game property to life i'm super excited it's loved around the world and we all speculate about what could it be what were there were some of the we came, came up with some wild ones some kind of out there ones too that could have worked or maybe not worked but yeah some people thought he was going to do doom again <laughs> right right yeah that, that i mean i just couldn't see that happening but crazier things has happened have happened and than they other, have and they have. <laughs> they have other than you know dwayne the rock johnson going back to doom but now we know what it is we know what that video game is, and I'm going to tell you right now, spoiler, I love it. I absolutely love it. Dwayne The Rock Johnson and his Seven Bucks production company are bringing us a It Takes Two movie. <laughs> and I will tell you right now, I love this. Now, I had never heard of this game until me, Ray, because uh, Ray was you, me, Ryan and Ann, I think we were watching the video game awards, the most recent video game awards. And so it came down to the final award of the night. We'd heard this game mentioned, been nominated in a number of categories called It Takes Two. And it was also nominated for Game of the Year and it won. And I'm like, I haven't even heard of this game. So Ann was like, I want to get it. I'm like, okay, let's download right now. And that night after watching the video game awards, we downloaded it. And then for the next number of weeks, Ann and I, a little bit of time every single night played It Takes Two. It's wonderful. It's an absolutely wonderful game. It's and it's awesome playing with somebody. I mean, like you play with somebody that you can have a lot of fun with, and it's absolutely fantastic. And the story is really sweet. It's a simple, sweet story, basically about this couple. And they have a little girl, and they haven't yet told the little girl that they're divorcing. And they're building up to it. But the little girl knows that there's something wrong with the parents. And one night, the little girl weeps at the fact that her parents aren't getting along, whatever. And her tears fall on these two separate, just random dolls that she's made herself. And then when her parents wake up, they're in the bodies of these dolls. And they basically have to try to get back to their, number one, their bodies, to get back to their daughter, all this kind of stuff. And it's very, very sweet. And I loved this game. And now Dwayne The Rock Johnson is bringing it to real life. I can only hope he's going to be playing the husband. They haven't said for sure that he's going to be starring in this, but I certainly hope he does. Rob, you hear that they're going to do an It Takes Two movie. What was your first reaction? Well, you know, at first I'd be like, wait, huh? But after, you know, you told the first time I even heard of the game was because of you and Ann playing it. And I wasn't. I know it won the video game awards. I was I don't know what I was sleeping on, but I didn't I had not heard of this game until you brought it up. But based on Dwayne The Rock Johnson, Dwayne Johnson's, at least his social media persona, family is, and it's not because of the Fast and Furious franchise, family is very important to him. You know, he's he's always posting pictures of, with the kids, and I, I think that this kind of game movie could be something that probably appeals to him because he wants to make um, a piece of real family entertainment that the young kids can like and their parents can like. Um, and this makes a lot of sense to me. And it seems in this day and age, this is the kind of material 
you know, the same way that people love Sonic. I could see people really digging this game. And I like, I haven't played it uh, with Elizabeth, but I could see people digging this game. I It is on my PlayStation 5, but I've never played it. I, I I highly recommend you and Elizabeth play. It's a lot. It means it's a mandatory co-op game. The two it's yeah. got to have two players. It's great. Ray, you were over here. You you watched us play a bunch of it. What did you think about the game? And what do you think about Dwayne Johnson doing it? In in terms of the game, it's a great game. Like it, it seems. Well, when you guys are playing it, I. It's just there's there's a lot of uh, you know you, whoever you play this game with, is key. You, you, That's key. No, no, but it tends I. It just you just bond with that person, yeah, and in a, in a different way. It's like, it's it's. If you brought it to Vegas, would you and I bond? Oh <laughs> man, you I know. would. I would pay good money to watch the two of you trying to play it takes two together. But who would, I would play pay the, good money? Who would play the? I'll play the girl. I'll play the girl. I'll play the girl. No, I'll play the. Girl. No, I will. <laughs> but you know what? <laughs> the with the Dwayne Johnson thing, like. A part of me is a little disappointed because I really wanted a Gears of War movie because oh. that's what I thought he was going to do. Um, I didn't know this game was out that long because remember when he was talking about how he was referring to, we've been working on this game for years to bring it to the big screen, right? Yeah. Which, which I, makes I, you wonder, have like, were was he trying to get on it before the game was even released? Like, even he just... Because sometimes books that are coming out the movie deals get made before yep. the books even get released could it be something like is that it, is it confirmed that this is the game that he was actually referring to no no he might See, there might be something else. Game. Yeah. it's yeah. possible but because because the well, when he was talking about it this just, game just came out what last year yeah two years ago i think two now? years ago that doesn't sound like a long time ago i'm i'm holding out hope that he's still doing another video game movie hopefully gears of war probably i i don't i don't know about the call of duty thing because it's it's a little too generic yeah. to actually yeah, be a yeah. movie. You know but, what? You can't be the girl. That's okay. okay. You can be the girl. But it it takes two. Uh, do you know? Do we know if it's animated or live action? No, yet? I, no. I haven't seen anything in there about. That Would it lend point. itself well to live action? It depends on how you do the two main characters. Hmm. I mean, be... what I don't want to see is like Dwayne the Rock Johnson in a funny wig and and a fat that, suit, but like it would have to be super CGI. It would be probably CGI a, maybe heavy. live action with that. Is CGI what about like a, a Nightmare Before Christmas stop motion vibe? I wouldn't be into that. No, no I, I would. Think lends, I don't think that lends itself to this to this game. Uh, yeah. But I will say this: what's interesting about the game too is that the game is almost every kind of genre. Like there are a lot of levels where it's a side scroller. Then there are some levels where it's like a uh, Street Fighter, where it's player versus player fight fight sort of thing then there's puzzle solving so kind of mm. like room or mist or whatever and it's got a whole bunch of different genres i, I gotta say some of the environments in, in the game Gorgeous. to see it on the big screen would be fantastic live action or animated and the game is just out there like whoever whoever uh thought that the game up has to be a little crazy somewhat or because super creative a super creative crazy Maybe a little high. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right, guys. Question is for you. Dwayne The Rock Johnson has said that they are producing and he may be starring in and it takes two. It's a wonderful game if you guys haven't played it. Do you like this idea? Do you think this is a good fit? Or maybe you've never heard of the game just like I never heard of it before the Video Game Awards. Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comment section below and leave your thoughts there. All right, guys. With that down, let's do one more off the top here, and that is this. For my own reasons, I am very excited for an upcoming Chris Pine movie known as Dungeons and Dragons. Obviously, I'm biased. I, I play Dungeons and Dragons. I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons since I was 14 years old. I, I love and, and other various role-playing games. Sure. Um, but I love D&D. I really got into recently what was the day uh, Vox Machina? Mm -hmm. the the animated one they did on amazon based on the critical role uh games and stuff like that and i thought it was great if you guys haven't watched vox machina you really should it's really really fun and very entertaining and ever since they announced this damn movie i'm like well i mean it can't possibly be any worse than the last dungeon and dragons movie with jeremy irons they're, they're like it can't be worse than that right so it's got to be better than that then they started to assemble a really impressive cast obviously we mentioned chris pine michelle rodriguez is in there uh, i like the director they attach been kind of well minor news here today which is why it's an off the top but paramount sent out an email blast today with a press release 
to talk about they've got the new title for the movie and the title art. The title for the movie is Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves. And I particularly, it, it's a fine title, whatever. The title won't make the movie any better or any worse. But I got to say, I love that they went with the classic Dungeons and Dragons art uh, and style for the title. Like that, that just makes my heart smile. Again, it's just a title. It will not make the movie any good. It's just title art. It will not make the movie any better. I'm just saying I like the title and I like the art. And I'm excited for this movie. And it's like I said, as long as it's better than the last one they did, it's got to be gravy. Rob, you had a chance to see the hear the title, see the title art. Where's your anticipation level been for this movie? And what do you think? Well, like you, uh, first of all, I like despite my discontent with modern Star Trek, I thought Chris Pine did a fantastic job as Kirk. And I loved him in movies like Hell and High Water. And I still think he's the best part of the Wonder Woman movies, to be honest. Uh, with I, he's he's a phenomenal actor. And, you know, he I think we covered that he talked about how much fun he was having making this movie. Oh, yeah. He was like talking. Yeah, he, he was talking on social media. He was like talking it up. And the fact that they're look, anybody that goes and uses that classic Dungeons and Dragons logo, that classic artwork, at least they're aware of the legacy of the game. And it's nice to see what at least the marketing department is because, you know, growing up for for some people, dude, Dungeons and Dragons was as big as Star Wars for other people. Yeah, I mean, I had friends that were. You see it now. People are still the 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 lore, the gameplay. The I mean, every kid I knew had a monster manual, even if you played the game or not. It's like parents would just give you the monster manual, not knowing it was a game. It's like a, I got. I had one. I I, I that was the first. That was the first Dungeons and Dragons book I had was that that first hardcover monster manual. Can I can I tell you just a quick thing here? Ann and I, we, we like to go find random like comic book stores, collectible stores, whatever we like game stores and just go visit them. Yeah. About three weeks ago we found one about twenty miles from here. We drove out and they had the original hardcover uh Dungeon Master Guide and Monster Manual. And I thought, how much well, these, were, they, were they selling? For I a, thought these were going to be about two hundred a hit. I don't know if they understood. They were twenty bucks a piece, and Anne was like, "Yoink!" They weren't reprints. No. So Anne, because you got to remember, Anne used to she used to play in the Wizards of the Coast staff. Dungeons and Dragons game because this is when Ann was like a big wig over at Hasbro, right? And she used to play with the Wizards of Coast people playing their game and stuff like that. She's played D and D with like the best of them. She's great. So she saw them. She's like yoink, and I, I'll show them to you. And like, I mean, they're a little worn, sure, worn, but I'm like, oh my god, I had these when I was a kid. Yeah, dude. these are incredible. Yeah, and so when you see them lean into that, you know that they're in touch with with the audience. And of course, Dungeons and Dragons has had a big resurgence. And it's great. That's great to see. I mean, I have to say, to be honest, I'm I'm kind of excited to see you, this movie. You know what we're gonna do when we move into the new studio? Mm -hmm. I made a decision. Like right now? Yep. Like <laughs> right now, I just made this decision. Oh shit! Oh, the best decisions are the ones made without yeah. any thought. Yeah, without any thought. Does that nope. mean I should get a new 65 inch OLED right now? Evaluating the consequences. Just yep. make the decision. I think that's what we're gonna do. I think in the new studio, we're going to get the five of us, us three, Chris and Aaron, and we are going to live stream our own RPG game. Uh, whether it's a D&D &D game, maybe a Star Wars game, maybe a DC Heroes game, but I think we're going to do a live stream. Maybe we'll do it over the course of a month. We'll do like one one thing a week, and we'll just do a simple and live stream as role playing. Because Ray, Ray's played in our D&D &D group. Yeah. You we're know, we need a fast as Star Trek we're, the role playing game. We're going to need a that. little bit more aviation gin for that to happen. <laughs> Ray will be great. Ray, yeah, I know it's my bottle. Yeah, gun, but right. as far as What's the title's bottle? concerned, it sounds. A, I don't know if this is the way because I don't know how other D and Ds are titled, but it sounds a little boring to me, to be honest. Honor it should be like it should be like cracking skulls and drinking <laughs> drinking beers. Dungeon Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons. Cracking skulls, cracking skulls and drinking beer. Or like, <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> what? Honor among thieves. It just reminds you know, me I, I, of the. I'm sure some industry vet is watching the show right now and is calling the marketing department, going, "You guys, this is the wrong title. This is the wrong." Actually, title. I got to tell you, cracking skulls and drinking beers that would say. Okay, our buddy Matt, who made the uh, Chef Pleasures graphic, Matt, if you're watching right now. 
please make a D&D title art of Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> what was it? Cracking skulls Those and drinking, drinking beers. beers. That's so, that's the name. So, because when I when I hear <laughs> honor of what is it? Honor, honor among of, thieves. Yeah. I just think of the Kevin Costner Robin Hood Prince of Thieves. Yeah. Like. Uh, I don't know. Well, also, I'm sure isn't, the movie isn't it kind of limiting, like th the, a thief character in Dungeons? Yeah, and that's Dragon? what I was gonna say too. It, it doesn't exactly. Well, no, she, she means probably your main character is a thief, right? Or a rogue, <laughs> right? That's what the rogue, rogues yeah, are. Or a rogue. But is the like thief that. the best character? In basic it's not. Dungeons? It's yeah. not. The barbarian is. That's Ray, Ray, calls, Ray loves the drinking barbarian beer. Yeah. <laughs> that's all I do in D and D. Well, whatever uh, I, you know i can't argue with his logic it's very sound this Anyways, is cogent reasoning here this is solid solid thought process question is for you guys what do you think about it i mean i listen the last movie was so abysmal abysmally ter terrible i don't blame anybody who's got zero anticipation for this I, I don't blame anyone but do you have any anticipation for it? what do you think about the title and the art whatever you guys think jump down into the conversation below and let us know your thoughts guys we want to thank the sponsor of today's video mint mobile you know the one with the delightful ads with good canadian kid ryan reynolds so look after years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by big wireless providers if we've learned anything is that there's always a catch so when i first heard that mint mobile offers premium wireless starting at just 15 dollars a month i thought what's the catch but after talking to them and using their service it all made sense there isn't a catch. And guys, that's no joke because for years I've been using one of the major providers and it was fine. But I switched over to Mint Mobile a little while ago. The service has been fantastic. And the big difference is I'm now paying about one third of what I was paying before. And the best part for anybody who just hates their phone bills is that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just $15 a month. All their plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash campia. That's mintmobile.com slash campia. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia. And a special thank you to the folks over at Mint Mobile for sponsoring this episode of the John Campus Show. Guys, I have been using it. It has been great, and it's a hell of a lot cheaper. And matter of fact, guys, all of our sponsors of today's shows, you can find links to them with the promo in there down in the description. Go and click on that there because when you support our sponsors, you're actually supporting us. So thank you again to the folks at Mint Mobile. All right. With that down... Let's move into our main topics here today, shall we? And how do we select our main topics here on the John Campy Show? Well, it's really simple. You see, you guys come up with our topics. Whenever you come across a big topic, issue, or story that you guys feel we need to cover as a main topic on the show, just go anytime, 24-7, over to www.thejohncampyshow.com slash contact. Once you guys get there, you're going to see a form. Fill it out with your topic or question. It's absolutely free. Hit submit, and then maybe, just maybe, you might see your submission featured as a main topic here on the John Campia Show. With that down, let's get into main topic number one, shall we? And our first main topic gets submitted to us by Carter G., who writes, Greetings, John and crew. I laughed out loud when I read a story this morning that HBO Max had a solid growth first quarter this year that was nearly double the growth that they had in the final quarter last year. Why this is funny is because their growth went up after ending their day-and-date release of movies in theaters and on HBO at the same time. You always said their day-and-date strategy wouldn't work. I think this proves you're right. What are your thoughts? All right, thanks a lot for saying that in. And listen, of course, Warner Brothers, HBO, HBO Max has been in the news a lot lately. Obviously, because Discovery is now the new Boston town. Two weeks ago, Discovery took it over. Discovery now owns Warner Brothers, Warner Media, HBO, all that kind of stuff as they plucked it away from AT&T. And I think good days are ahead for them as a result. <clears throat> now, one of the more controversial things that happened with Warner Brothers in 2021 was the fact that Jason Kalar announced back in the day that in 2021, all of Warner Brothers movies would be released in theaters and on HBO Max on the exact same day. And they were convinced that this was going to cause HBO Max to explode in popularity. We all said, here on this show at least, 
No, it won't. <laughs> this is going to cause you problems. As a matter of fact, this is going. This is antithetical to what it is trying to accomplish. Because if you have a movie have an ex, have an exclusive theatrical debut first and play in theaters for a while, then you release it on HBO Max. There'll be bigger buzz for it. More people like, I love that movie. I got to watch it. It's on HBO Max. If I want to watch it again, great. I'll sign up. You would have had bigger growth. Now through 2021, we discussed this and we showed the charts. HBO Max grew. It definitely did. But it just grew at the same growth trajectory it already had leading up into that point. As a matter of fact, in the first quarter of 2021, when HBO first instituted their thing of day and date release, they had four major films come out in that window. They had the uh, Jared Leto, Denzel Washington the uh, little movie, things. The Little Things. That was the highlights. So you had Tom and Jerry came out during that. You had the Academy level film of uh, Judas and the Black Messiah. You had Godzilla versus Kong come out all in the first quarter. And they added 3 million new subscribers. Okay. With all those films coming out, Dandies, HBO Max. The things declined, though. The final quarter of 2021, when they were releasing all their films on, on whatever, too, they had 1.8 million new subscribers. So they had diminishing results. Well, a new report just came out that HBO Max in the first quarter of this year, after they stopped doing day and date releases, they actually gained 3 million new subscribers. Compare that to the final quarter of 2021 when they were putting their movies out in theaters and on HBO at the same time. They had 1.8 million. Stop doing that. They had 3 million new subscribers. Now, that doesn't prove much. This is anecdotal. But it does obviously suggest that, huh, I guess that whole strategy of, well, if we put in an HBO Max the same day, that'll make HBO Max grow even faster. No, it didn't. And this proves that. This proves that. Now, what is also really interesting is that we're seeing in the first quarter that HBO Max is adding 3 million subscribers while Netflix lost overall subscribers. Now, of course, Netflix has a much deeper market penetration already than HBO Max does. So they clearly have more to lose. But still, it's interesting, which brings up a lot of questions, Rob, about, well, why could HBO Max without releasing their movies day and date in theaters and whatever. Why did HBO Max have success this first quarter, whereas Netflix struggled? We're going to talk more about Netflix a little bit later. So, Rob, two questions I pose to you. What does the fact that while they were putting movies on HBO Max in theaters on the same day, they got 1.8 million new subscribers. Now that they don't, they get 3 million new subscribers. But then also, what does it tell us about the difference between HBO and Netflix that in this same time period, HBO can have this kind of growth while Netflix suffered loss? How do you see it? Well, I mean, I don't know if you can compare and contrast Netflix to, to HBO because Netflix obviously is much bigger than HBO and had a lot more subscribers. But I think that, like you said, a theatrical movie, John, uh, what do, you, what do you say? Winning winning cures everything? Yep. Well, a theatrical movie cures, even if a theatrical movie doesn't do well at the box office, at least it was theatrical. And people have heard about it. People talk about it. People have gone to see it. You know somebody who probably went to see this movie in a theater. And when it shows up on a streaming service, whether you're paying attention or not, because most people are not us, John. They're not movie pundits. They don't know exactly when things are going when and where they're opening and who's coming, to, you know. So... All you hear is that your friend, oh, I saw this movie, and oh, it's on HBO Max after the Batman is on HBO Max now. I've heard from so many people over the last couple of days that did not go to the theater to see the Batman, and they're talking about it on social media. I'm blown away by how many people didn't go see it in the theater. Well, it didn't make $2 billion. I mean, it made a lot of money, but it didn't make a billion. Yeah, well, I would imagine people would have signed up. People I probably know signed up for HBO Max just to see the Batman, and they're they're talking about it. So it does not surprise me that now that that day and date strategy, what Dune, you know, was a day and date movie, but now we've got other big Warner Brothers movies showing up on HBO Max. I think it was a smart move to get rid of that. We've talked about how dumb it was in the first place, and I think that you know HBO Max. We've talked about on the show that they have A list programming. They have dropped a lot of good stuff in the first quarter of this year. 
A lot of good, we talk about how good winning time is. Yeah. There's the Minx. Yeah. There's a lot of great programming. HBO is always adding, what do you call HBO? The it, It's the standard by they, which. Yeah, they're the gold standard. Gold standard. Yeah. When it comes to television. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Like programming, yeah. A lot of good stuff that they've added. They've also got things like Friends that people paid, hundred Netflix paid $100 million in 2019 to air it for a year. So there's a lot of stuff. HBO is a great service and people are coming to it. And as they add more theatrical movies, they're going to see more growth. And, you know, Erin pointed this out yesterday, and I think she made a great point when she was saying that when you look at what HBO drops, they drop a lot less at much higher quality. Like everything they do, everything they put out, like you were just mentioning Minx, finally watched the first two episodes of Minx excellent uh, isn't it good actually i don't like it quite as much as winning time no 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 but i mean excellent winning time my favorite thing on television right now like whenever they put out something whether it's euphoria or, or whatever they always aim that whatever we're going to put on our they understand this what we put on our network becomes representative of our network and assume i heard one hbo person say this before we assume that Whatever we put on, we assume that that's going to be somebody's first experience with our programming. Then you want to make sure you're not putting out a whole load of crap, whereas Netflix has a different philosophy. They have some excellent stuff, Netflix. They do. They produce some amazing television shows, but they also produce a ton of low-quality crap that they just throw on there. They take a quantity over quality approach, and it's worked for them for a long time, to be fair. It has. But it's just like when a new show comes out on HBO Max, you just go, even if I know nothing about it, it's probably something to at least check out because they only put out quality stuff. So, I mean, that that figures in there too. So, it's interesting stuff. Anyway, guys, question is for you. What do you think about this? HBO Max is having some success in the first quarter, whereas Netflix is struggling badly. Also, in the first quarter that they're doing it without putting their movies on HBO Max the same day that's in theaters like they did in 2021, they nearly doubled their growth. How do you guys see this? Whatever your thoughts are, jump down to the comment section below and leave those thoughts there. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to main topic number two, shall we? And our second main topic today gets submitted to us by Eric Thomas. And Eric Thomas writes, Sony announced yesterday that Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse would be moving from October 22nd to June 2023. Give me a second. No! Damn it! Anyway, this is the second release date change, the original release date being April of 2022. Is Sony running into a production issue here uh, where they need more time to make this movie than originally anticipated? Most animated, most animated movies need about five to six years to get made, while Sony looked at making two sequels to Spider-Verse in the span of five years originally. Did they rush it and are now realizing that? All right, thanks a lot for saying that in, man. And damn it! Sorry, John. This is the worst news I've gotten today. Granted, if this is the worst news I get today, today's a pretty good day. But you guys know, for if you watch the show at any kind of regularity, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, I think, is a top 10 greatest comic book movie ever made. I thought, and I'm not kidding, and I stand by it to this day, in 2018 when this movie came out, it's the same year that Black Panther came out, and Avengers Infinity War came out. I will have this debate with anybody. I believe that Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse was the best comic book movie that year. I still believe that. And I think it's one of the two best Spider-Man movies ever made. Maybe even the best one between that and Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2. Neither of which were Marvel productions, by the way. But either way, I love this. And this was a movie I am not ashamed to tell you. I poo-pooed. <laughs> On the very notion of this movie, I said I thought this was a dumb idea going up to about a year before it came out. Ah, okay, I man, that's fine. But most people don't know Miles Morales. And then the first trailer came out, and I was like, nah, animation style looks dumb to me. I was one of the very, very few people who thought the animation didn't look good. I'm like, nah, the animation style doesn't look good to me, and... Why are they doing this? And, ah, blah, blah, blah. and then I saw it. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is why you take your expectations and you leave them at the door. Because I went and I saw this movie, this movie I was sure I wasn't going to like. 
and I walked out flabbergasted. I, I think I said it was like the first time I had come out of a movie since Schnepp had passed away, where I came out and I literally stood there going, God, I wish Schnepp could have saw, so seen this. Oh, Schnepp he, would have loved this. He movie. would have loved it. It, it was like, and, and then such a great Stan Lee cameo. Because I think this was the first... Was this not the first comic book movie that came out after Stan Lee passed? I can't remember exactly. I can't, it might have been. But they had a wonderful Stan Lee cameo in it, which was just fantastic. No refunds. I, I just, it was great. And I love this movie. And when they announced that they were going to be doing another one, I absolutely flipped. Absolutely flipped. It's been pushed to 2023. This comes just from the folks over at Deadline write the following. Sony's animated sequel to the Oscar-winning movie Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse uh, is moving from October 7th of this year to June 2nd of 2023. The news is breaking just before the studio's presentation at CinemaCon next week, which we're about to talk about here in a few minutes. Meanwhile, the movie's sequel, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse Part 2, is now dated for March 29th, 2024. The movies will screen in premium large formats and IMAX. The filmmakers behind the animated sequel is uh, Joaquin Dos Santos, Kemp Powers, and Justin K. Thomas. The first movie made over $375 million worldwide. And this would be my first dedication to Chris Carr for why. For why? Why is this movie being delayed? Damn it! I got. To, I still remember when the first teaser came out for that, and with that music and the colors, the palette, and everything. And I got so damn excited and looked great. Then it was just not long ago, Rob, that they put out that whole, you know, this uh, this little bit of footage from it from the, uh, assumingly the first act of the movie like spider-man 2099 well well spider-man 29 but when gwen comes through and she's hanging out miles room miles acting all awkward by the way miles clearly looks a little bit older now because his body's a little bit bigger so i think that's really great and i'm like okay this wasn't a lot long ago. i'm like i got so excited i can't help but think rob that our our viewer is right this is probably a a production issue i mean it did seem a little ambitious even though i wish it could have come out last year sure um but my guess is here that this is exactly that it, it, they're probably not up to schedule they're probably falling behind a little bit um i don't think it has anything to do with problems with the film i think this is exactly what our viewer wrote in and said this is probably a production issue a line anyway rob where's your expectation level right now what do you think about the move and what do you think caused the move well i you know i loved into the spider verse as well and i i, I want to I look at it this way. Just I want to see these movies, John. <laughs> I don't want to wait. I want to see them. But you know, a good friend of ours, friend of our channel, uh, was telling me that he was talking to a friend of his who was an exec at Paramount, and they were really worried that they weren't going to get Sonic Two into theaters on time because the visual effects wouldn't be done. Not it wasn't anybody's fault, but because of COVID and everything, and there's just the talent and the tools are slammed. And I think a lot of what happened with Warner Brothers Slate as they pushed it into 2023, like The Flash and, and the other films, I think this has been across the board. These movies, these films that are labor intensive, require a lot of effects artists and, and make no mistake, even though it's an animated film, it requires a lot of effects artists to work on it. I think this is absolutely a production issue a production pipeline issue. Everyone is trying to get these giant tentpole, very expensive movies out the door. And there's only a, there's only a finite amount of talent that can work on these things. I think there's an effects pipeline backup. And I think that these uh, delays, you know, some of it's COVID related, some of it isn't, but these delays are absolutely production issues. There's nothing nefarious here. There's not a problem with the story. It just, it literally, you only have so much time and so many people in a day to get the work done. And what becomes apparent that they're never going to make their date because they don't want to spend, you know, paying a crew to work 24 seven or having crews come in 12 hours on 12 hours off. And you have people working that becomes incredibly cost prohibitive very, very quickly. So, I would imagine this is almost a year. It's a year push, right? Um, eight months. Eight months. Okay, it's that's that's a production issue, uh, and I think that's what they're dealing with. And I I I think that that's why a lot of these big budget, especially superhero films, are being delayed. Yeah, you know, I remember. Go back to 2020. I remember you and I having conversations on this show about the fact that, like, obviously we're in the we were in the the depths of the pandemic, and you know, the, all the movies are getting pushed. Production was shut down. And I remember you and I said, 
we said the repercussions of all this, all these movies having to move and all the productions being shut down, the repercussions of this are not just going to be when the pandemic ends. It's going to be for a few years after the pandemic ends. Absolutely. Number one, because movie schedules, like they're already, we said there are already movies planned for 2022. Now movies that were going to come out in 2021 or sometimes 2020 are going to get push it's going to create a huge backlog but we also said there's going to become a production crunch because movies that were supposed we had a year and a half worth of movies that didn't get produced and now they're trying to move but the problem is a lot of movies as far ahead as hollywood plans things there are a lot of movies who are already booking post-production houses visual effects companies uh, sound studios, locations and sets, they're already booked for 2022. And now you're getting a more of a backlog in there. And, and I think right now we are starting to feel that, what's it called, the, the, the second earthquake, the aftershock. I feel right now in the production world, we're feeling the aftershock of the pandemic. Totally agree. we're probably going to get it for the next year or two. And you know, I was talking on the next Designing Hollywood podcast, uh, Linda Muir, who is the costume designer on The Northman. I interviewed her last night. And she was even talking about how the costume departments have to deal with COVID protocols and the sterilization of, of costumes and keeping them clean and how it adds time and money, a lot of money to the budget. And so they're dealing with these in-place protocols, even at effects houses, in order to make sure that the spread of the disease, the pandemic is curtailed. And that has been a huge issue. So that's all part of what you just said, the aftershock. And it's just something we're going to have to deal with. All right, guys, question is for you. What do you, damn it, just damn it. What do you guys think about the fact that Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse Part 1 has unfortunately been delayed from October to, where, where was it, July or June, whatever. It's being pushed into 2023. I mean, it's kind of, un, I get it, I do. We're still going to get the movie, but I'm bummed out about it. How do you guys feel about it? Whatever you think, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. Hey guys, we want to take a moment and thank the sponsor of today's video, me undies now look if you're anything like me when you run out of underwear the first thing you do is you just run to the big store and buy the cheapest pack you can or you jump online and buy a big bag of some cheap underwear and it's you know as long as it's not uncomfortable it's fine and that's the way life was for me until i got my first package of me undies and i put on that first pair i got and i was like this is how good things can be when you got underwear that's not just not comfortable but actual comfortable underwear and that's what me undies delivers and i will never go back the me undies membership is literally designed to make your life easier with free shipping and returns on every order saving on virtually everything they make exclusive sales and early access to their newest stuff there's kind of no reason not to join new prints drop monthly so there's always something new to see but you can always skip delivery for the month or even cancel any time no questions asked and guys right now me undies has a great offer for my audience for any first time purchasers you get 15 percent off and and for a limited time, if you sign up for their free to join Me Undies membership, you get 25% off your first membership item. So to get 25% off your first membership item or 15% off your first order and a 100% satisfaction guarantee, go to MeUndies.com slash Campia. That's MeUndies.com slash Campia. Campia. And a big thank you to the good folks at MeUndies for sponsoring this episode of the John Campia Show. Once again, find their link down in the description below. Okay, guys, with that down, let's move on to main topic number three. And our third main topic today gets submitted to us by Maxi S. And Maxi S writes, Hi, J JC and crew. Can you give us a preview of what you are most anticipating at CinemaCon? Movie previews, exclusive screenings, panels. I'm guessing if there's a surprise screening, it'll most likely be Boz Lerman's Elvis biopic. Thanks, and bring on the filthy. All right, Maxie, thanks a lot for sending that in. And yeah, listen, I have been saying for a lot of years, my favorite annual movie event is not Comic-Con. It's CinemaCon. CinemaCon is great. Now, for those of you who don't know anything about CinemaCon, it is the annual gathering of NATO, the National Association of Theater Owners. And all the movie theater owners, so AMC, Regal, uh, Arclight, uh, RAP Arclight, but uh, all the mom and pop theaters across the country, they all come and gather together in Las Vegas 
for a week long conference talking about the industry and where all the movie studios come and give these movie theater owners big presentations about their movies they have coming up this year and the following year. And it has been wonderful. I love going to sing. Rob, you came with me to uh, CinemaCon a couple of years ago. I loved it. We had such a good time. You were on, you were on a, uh, a production trip last year, so you couldn't come with me yeah. and Aaron, but me and Aaron went last year. Uh, and it was so fantastic. And next week, we are going to Vegas for CinemaCon. We're going to be broadcasting and streaming from CinemaCon all week. Very exciting. And clearly, you guys like it a lot, too, because what happens is what Rob and I did and what Aaron and I did is we go to the big presentation, then we go right back to the room and live stream, give you guys a full breakdown of what we saw. We take your questions on it. It's always a good time. So what is coming to CinemaCon this week? Well, let's break it down for you a little bit so you can get a little bit of an idea here about what we're looking at, what you can expect us to be broadcasting and streaming. So let's go over here and take a look at this, shall we? This is what's coming up at CinemaCon. Here's the schedule. Okay, so on Monday, uh, we're going to do a John Campia show on Monday morning, all right, from the new office. Now, it won't be on the new stage. It'll just be from my private office because <laughs> that's the part that'll be set up is my own personal little private office at our new studio is going to be set up. We're going to do the John Campia show from my office on Monday. Then as soon as that show is done, we get in the car and we drive to Vegas so we're not going to make it there for the Admit One Hospitality Lounge or some of these other things. But the big main thing, by, by the way, 4 p.m., listen to this, new revenue streams via gaming and esports. If we, I don't know that we'll be there by 4 o'clock, but if we are... Fascinating stuff. I wouldn't mind going to this presentation because like, this could be really interesting. Remember, these are presentations being given to the movie theater owners. New revenue streams of via gaming and esports. That could be interesting. But the big event uh, will be there in time for the pre-reception, the pre-opening reception. That'll be nice. Get our crunk on. Get our crunk on. But the big event Monday night, CinemaCon 2022 opening night, the presentation from Sony Pictures. Now, obviously, one of the things they will not be giving us is Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse Part 1. But... I do expect a lot of footage, and this is a two-hour presentation. So just so you guys know, there are no panels at CinemaCon. Like when it comes to the studio presentations, they don't do panels. They do presentations. So like the head of the studio will come out and talk for a bit. And it's in the giant, beautiful Celine Dion Theater. Yep. I mean, it's a monstrous venue with a giant screen and sound system. So when they show clips, it's dope. It's amazing. Yeah. And this, this theater is massive. It's massive. If you want to see how big the theater is, go back last year. Look up Aaron Aaron's Shang-Chi reaction. Because I do a little footage of us walking to the theater, and a lot of people commented on that video. Look how big that place is. It's huge. The auditor, It's incredibly big. But anyway, so they do presentations where they show us, like last year they showed us like 13, 15 minutes of Top Gun. They'll give us the first previews. They'll have the directors or the stars talk about their movies, whatever. It's a big, big preview, big, big presentation, always great. And so on Monday evening, and we're going to get the Sony CinemaCon presentation from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Once again, that is Los Angeles time. So what you guys can expect is that probably at about 9 p.m. to 9.15, we will then go live from the, my hotel room, and we're going to give you our reactions. We're going to tell you everything that we saw. We're going to break down what we saw, all that kind of stuff. So make sure you guys plan to join us for that. And that is Monday at CinemaCon. All right. We move on now to Tuesday at CinemaCon. We got our continental breakfast, Rob. It's you know. very fine. Yeah, very fine, fine breakfast. Um, then we got some of their <clears throat> workshops that they've got. We're not really interested in the workshops. But then we've got at 9.15 a.m. on Tuesday, we have the State of the Industry presentation and a presentation from Neon Studios. Now Which I can't wait for. This is the one that Rob is really stoked about. Rob, why are you so excited for this Neon presentation on Tuesday oh, morning? Oh, well, there's a little movie coming out that I've wanted to see literally for 25 years. David Cronenberg's new film, Crimes of the Future. If you have not watched both the teaser and the French trailer, this script was insane. Absolutely 
bonkers. And it, 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 David Cronenberg is going back to his body horror roots that he pioneered with Shivers, a.k.a. They Came From Within, and Rabbit, and The Brood, and Scanners, and Videodrome, and The Fly, and Dead Ringers, and Crash. He's coming back. Neon is releasing it. I'm expecting a big push from them. Maybe we're not going to get it, but I think it's going to open at Cannes. It's going to make a splash there. It's going to open in June, other places, and it's being released by Neon, John. And if they show us like a clip or something, I am going to go bananas. Now, so this particular uh, presentation, this goes from 9.15 to 11.30 a.m. So what you guys can expect from us is probably around 12, 12, 15 p.m. We will come back and we will give you our report and our breakdown. We will live stream our reaction and Rob's particular reaction to the Neon presentation. All right. We keep going on on Tuesday, and then we get our hospitality, we get our lunch and sweet. By the way, at these things, they give us a lot of food, a lot of drinks, and a lot of parties. Do they? <laughs> oh, they do. Because I remember... You were in the room most of the time. Oh, well, yeah. With the nosebleed. Because the one continental breakfast that I went to, it was just honey buns and cheese danish. <laughs> yeah, but their <laughs> lunches and their dinners and their parties... And also, the restaurants in Caesars... Oh yeah. I, well, I, uh, I haven't been there since the first one. So yeah, you, you and I have been to Vegas time, together yeah. a long time. All right, so let's keep going here. So Vegas, that, baby. That is Vegas. that. So trade show, all that kind of stuff. But then at four p.m. on Tuesday, the Warner Brothers presentation. WB now under the leadership of David Zaslav, uh, Toby Emmerich, who is still he's the one guy. Jason Kalar didn't survive, and Asarnoff didn't survive. Toby Emmerich survived. He is still the chairman of Warner Brothers Picture Group. He will be there leading the presentation uh, for their for Warner Brothers and says, uh, come and join us uh, and all this kind of stuff for their big presentation of the upcoming slate. That is a two-hour presentation on, again, that's on Tuesday, 4 to 6 p.m. So what you guys can assume from us is that on Tuesday, probably about 6.30, 6.45 in the evening, we will be doing our Warner Brothers presentation reaction, telling you guys everything, that all the clips they showed us, the trailers they showed us, the announcements that they make, all this stuff. Going to be a good time. That comes to us on Tuesday evening. Now, later on in Tuesday evening, we have a, we have a dinner party. And then at 8.30 p.m., two on the same day, Universal Pictures and Bloomhouse present a special number one the universal presentation a little bit no the universal presentation is the next day they're giving us a screening of the new ethan hawk horror film the black phone which we have been we have been buzzing about this ever since they showed us a huge preview for it at last year's CinemaCon. this is going to be great special screening of black phone so obviously probably about 11 p.m 11 15 we're going to come go live and we're going to give you our reaction and review uh of the new black phone movie very very stoked for this one okay so that's tuesday now we go on to wednesday on wednesday uh more breakfast uh cinemacon foundation uh trade suites more sh more food but at 9 45 in the morning to 11 30 Walt Disney Studios invites you to a special presentation highlighting its upcoming release schedule. And all I know is this. I, st I spoke to somebody at Disney. I tried to get some information about what they're going to show. Wouldn't tell me anything, but they did said it's, say it's going to be very exciting. I would imagine, John, the thing that I want most out of this panel is I want a glimpse of Avatar 2. I gotta believe they're gonna show us. They have they're to gonna show. show us the first bit of Avatar 2 footage. I guarantee they will. And, and before that, I mean, not that they would... Maybe a glimpse of Wakanda Forever? I 100% believe they're going to show us some Wakanda Forever. Here's the other thing I'm going to predict. Deadpool 3. They're, I, I think they're going to give us solid... Now, here's the thing. The one argument against them giving us some big Deadpool 3 information is the fact that, generally speaking, they are highlighting the movies and projects that are coming out in the next 12 months. Yeah, this year. Deadpool is not coming out within the next 12 months. All right? Deadpool 3 is not going to be out within the next 12 months. They haven't even started shooting it yet. But I still believe, because remember, at the last CinemaCon you were at with me, Alan Horn came out on stage, and he talked about Deadpool 3 uh, like three different times. Yes, he did. Right? That was four years ago. 
So I think they're going to give us some big announcement about Deadpool three. I really to, just to get the movie theater owners. Excited. Yeah, I mean Deadpool had just gone over to Disney. You know they had yep. just made the deal. But I I would expect. I mean I don't know if Kevin Feige is going to speak. But you've got Doctor Strange, Thor: Love and Thunder, Wakanda Forever. So there'll be three movies coming out after CinemaCon, uh, Marvel films. You've got Avatar two, another big heavy hitter. And don't forget the dis the the whole Disney pla- other platform movies Light, besides Marvel. Lightyear. Yep. You know, which that, well, we'll talk about that, but uh, Lightyear. Uh, so that's five huge films. And I don't even know. I'm sure they've got something else. Is Frozen 2 coming out this year or did that already come out? I mean, that you know, came out years ago. Years, yeah. It's Frozen 2. <laughs> First, they're going to be Frozen 3. You know, yeah. they're going to announce whatever. Not, but again, it's like something like Deadpool. The reason I'm going to stick with Deadpool is because, again, like it's not going to come out in the next 12 months. But right. I think, remember, the whole reason the studios come to this thing is to excite the movie theater owners. The owners now. The owners. So Not, I, not us. Not the us. The owners. The owners. The theater owners. And I don't think they're going to go into a lot of detail. They're obviously not going to show any footage. But I think they're going to have, they may even have Ryan Reynolds come out on stage. And uh, owner of Mint Mobile, by the way. Uh, can I walk up to him and say that I know you? And say, can you autograph my bottle of aviation? Oh, I don't have it. Ray took it. Yeah, Ray took it. I've got no, no he didn't take yeah. it. He finished it. He finished it watching Moon Knight. But I, but I think they could totally say, and guys, get ready for, for your theaters because how was that episode, Deadpool's- anyways, of Moon Knight? How was yeah, it? you're a little, you're a little out of it. And they might. Do you think they might announce a new Star Wars movie? They could. They could very well announce. Like I said, because they're obviously not going to show any footage of anything right. that's not coming out this year. Right. But they may may make some announcements just to excite the theater owners, and they've done that. Okay, so that is at 9.45 in the morning on Wednesday to 11.30. So once again, somewhere between 12 and 12.15 that day, we will go live to give you our full breakdown of the Disney presentation, telling you everything that we saw, everything that excited us, maybe the things that disappointed us. We'll see. All right. Still on Wednesday... We've got more hospitality lo- lounges, a free lunch, and then at 4.15, Universal Pictures and Focus Features together invite you to a special presentation featuring footage from their upcoming slate. Uh, this is going to be the main hosted by Donna Langley, who is the chairman of Universal Films Entertainment Group. Uh, a two-hour and 15-minute presentation. I- they could go pretty quick and then give us like, an hour and 50 minute surprise screening of something jurassic world oh i can't believe they'll show us jurassic world mm. holy shit they could show us jurassic world i don't know that's, i don't know that's not enough time to show us jurassic. it's a, a but 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 they tricked us last year they tricked us last year with sony because sony's presentation wasn't scheduled to be long enough for a ghost after warner brothers right it's it's after Warner right, and brothers. after disney so after, and after disney so they, it's not like there's another presentation that there's day. no other see. presentation after it nope i mean they're there's not gonna be chance, like, and then. you guys get to see because dude that movie's been done for quite some time you guys are the first people to see jurassic world domination or dominion it's jurassic world dominion, dominion. uh it's not like someone's gonna they're gonna think have of the sh- nation of domination that yeah. it, yes i'm just saying that that would be the obvious thing to show because it opens in early June. Okay, I'm just going to say this. I have heard nothing that they're showing us Jurassic World. I haven't either. But oh my God, well, what if they show us Jurassic World? Okay, but at the very minimum, they're going to show us a bunch of Jurassic World. Yeah, yeah. Like of that, I have no doubt. We're probably going to see a good 10, 15 But that was a movie that started thing. early in the pandemic. It got yep. shut down and went back. I mean, this film has been done for a while. and And why not? It's not like... They're gonna. It's dinosaurs eating people in cities. I mean, it's not like it's not like the shocking revelations about the multiverse, or maybe there are. Maybe okay. And then anyway, after the Universal and um, feature films, feature fo- focus features presentation, I should say. Uh, then we have a big party at the Omni Nightclub. Omni Nightclub is a great club, by the way. So they're going to do that. All right, that's Wednesday. Let's go over to Thursday. <clears throat> Thursday, we've got uh, more seminars, things like that, and then uh, breakfast, and then 9.15, we have Paramount Picture Studios presents an exclusive screening of Top Gun Maverick. Bruh. We will be watching Top Gun on Thursday morning at 9.15. Uh, super. I, I Listen, I have been very lukewarm about Top Gun Maverick. Up until last CinemaCon when they showed us 12 to 15 to 18 minutes of it. And Aaron and I both came out going, 
oh my God, what did we just see? It it looks like it's going to be amazing. Like the footage we saw was incredible. And they're going to show us the full movie this year. I'm very, very stoked about it. Do you think it. Tom Seale will come out and introduce it? I have no doubt Tom Cruise is going to come out and introduce it. Tom Cruise is a huge movie theater guy. He's He's been to CinemaCon many times. So I have no doubt that Tom Cruise is going to be there. Do you think that might show footage from the next Mission Impossible? Yes. Because this presentation is three hours long. Oh, jeez. Oh, bro. So Top Gun is not three hours. three hours. So they're going to have some more time in there to present <laughs> some other stuff. So, uh, yeah. I think we're going to see maybe some little... Because, because remember, last year, they showed us like a 20-minute feature on the next Mission Impossible. They showed us like this 20 minute feature about them making the next Mission Impossible. So yeah. they'll definitely have some Mission Impossible stuff. Uh, because to show there's us. got to be a trailer for Mission Impossible 3 in front of Top Gun. I mean, in Mission Impossible, what, 7, 8, 7 in front of Top Gun. They have to do that. I mean, when, they, when it's in the theaters. All right. Then, after that's done, Paramount is treating us to a big uh, lunch program to celebrate Top Gun Maverick. So I don't know what that's going to include. And then at 2.45. We have the Lionsgate presentation uh, that's being hosted by Joe Drake. He's the chairman of the motion picture group for Lionsgate. I think we're going to see some John Wick. I do, too. I think John Wick is definitely going to be on. Yeah. Oh, yes. There's going to be some John Cracking Wick Cracking heads and drinking beers. <laughs> and, uh, and that is the final big presentation. Now, after that is the CinemaCon, what they usually wrap things up with, is the the Big Screen Achievement Awards. This year, they're honoring Zoe Saldana, Robert De Niro, Billy Eichner, uh, Glenn Powell. So they're, they're, all these guys are going to be there. They're going to have a little award ceremony. And then everything wraps up with a, from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m., but that always goes to like 1 or 2 in the morning with the big company closing awards after party that they do. Which we won't be there for, because I think we are gonna. As soon as the Lionsgate presentation is done, I think we're gonna we're gonna go back to the room, once again do our live stream, tell you guys all about it, which we'll also do for Top Gun. We will give you our out of the theater reaction. We'll give you our full review of it. We'll take your questions about it. We'll do all that kind of stuff. Then we'll do the same thing for the Lionsgate presentation, and then we're gonna pack up and go. That 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 weather in the chat just brought up something. Do you think we'll see anything Pinocchio? Who's doing Pinocchio again? Disney live action with Tom Hanks. Remember, we got that yes. like little, little uh, image, that exclusive image of mm -hmm. uh, Tom Hanks. Maybe they'll show something with that. I have no doubt they will. Yep. Because that's remember when we hear about the Disney presentation. Obviously, we focus in on the MCU. Right. But that's why I was bringing. Don't forget, there's all the other Disney stuff as well. So I wouldn't doubt all Tom Hanks comes out on stage. I mean, if I, oh God, if I got to meet Tom Hanks, oh, that would be there, so sad. That would be very sad. I mean, because, yeah, you have to understand my life mission right now is to get an opportunity for Ann to meet Tom Hanks. That's it. I, without a word, of, I would I would quit. I would quit my career. I would give everything up if I could get Ann the opportunity to meet Tom Hanks, because my my mission in life as a husband would then be complete. Ooh. That, that That's it. Someone else brought up Oppenheimer. Well, well, yeah, yeah. It's a little when too is, early, right? When is, they just, when is it supposed to come out? Oh, uh, I don't. I because they're it. filming. Are they? They're already. Yeah, filming. they're shooting. Because if it comes out before April of 2023, I don't know. Ray, look that up. Because yep. if it comes out before next next CinemaCon, they could very well do a presentation on it. And That's then, Universal, right? And then someone else brought up Little Mermaid. Of course, we'll probably see something with that too, right? Yeah, Oppenheimer they, isn't Disney. That is that's Universal because because yeah. uh, he's no longer working with Warner Brothers at this point. But yeah, so there we go. Oh, well, maybe not. It's it's 2023, July. When, okay, 2023. 2023 then they probably no, won't give. Yeah, no. They'll probably do a big thing on it next year. So Rob, I, that's the schedule. You guys clear. We're going to be doing multiple live streams every day. It's going to be a lot of fun. Rob, after that huge schedule rundown we just went through, what are you most excited about for CinemaCon? Well, to be honest, I I do want to see a glimpse of Avatar too. You know, yeah. because you never bet against James Cameron. But, I, you know, whether we see stuff from John Wick, I just like to see. I remember, even though it didn't turn out to be great, you, you weren't at the panel, the Paramount panel. But the last time when they showed, like, a lot of Terminator Dark Fate. Right. Tim Miller came out. And it's always, you know, I'm not going to lie. It always feels like you're in the know. You know, when you get to see a glimpse of something no one else is going to see that they don't just released. Like at Comic-Con, when they show you a trailer early, it's going to release to the internet in a few hours. Oh, yeah. We but saw stuff, stuff at, at CinemaCon 
Aaron and I eight months ago tons of shit that yeah. they never released to the public. Yeah, you can dine out on that for a long time. Yeah. I, I have to say, you know, I feel like uh, an industry insider, John, when I get to see <laughs> And even just seeing Top Gun, you know, coming out. I know it's only a couple weeks before it opens, but I like, I like it, it reminds me uh, of the excitement that I'm still able to have. You know, the, the kid inside me, the, the, the eternal 12-year-old that I am, always is tickled being able to be given a glimpse behind the curtain a little a little early, earlier than everyone else. And let's face it, it's part of fandom. When you get to see stuff that no one else has seen yet, you can, you can walk up and go, yeah. Hey, Ray, can you be fair? Can Guess you look something up for me? When is Indiana Jones now supposed to come out? Oh. I totally forgot. I know it got pushed to 2023, but I can't remember when in 2023. It is June 30th. Okay, so they won't be. They they, they might give it an announcement or something. They about might it. show something though. Well, but I, it doesn't come out this between now and the no, next. No, I know, but the next cinema. Con. Again, they've been. They might tease it, announce you it. You never look, know. Look, they showed Top Gun. They didn't. Well, they pushed it back since. The yeah, but it got pushed back. See, when they showed us Top Gun, it was supposed to come out in two months. And then it yeah, got but they might they year. might because it is Indiana Jones. I would imagine it'd be maybe first dude if they show I'd lose my shit. <laughs> yeah, I would too. Well, I didn't hear what, who was the last uh, movie studio that was Lionsgate. Doing? Lionsgate is the last one yeah. scheduled. Okay. Yeah, so I think we're get some John Wick. We're gonna get a whole bunch of stuff there. So. You know, and if if they do show a little bit more of Thor: Love and Thunder, they show Wakanda Forever. You know, they show. Yeah. I, 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 There's I'm gonna be a lot. The Disney one's stuff. gonna have a lot. Ray, what about you? Like, out of all the stuff we got coming up here, is there anything you're particularly excited about seeing? Uh, not, not the three hour presentations, but I do want to. No, no, no. To be serious, I do want to come out of this feeling like every mo movie studio has shown us their exact path, like. For the next year not just their next movie i want to i want to get excited for things further down the line yep yeah and whether it's a it's it's a just a title screen or maybe even like some surprise news of oh we're doing this movie yeah you know i just want to come out thinking that every presentation was worth sitting through that's all. That's all I asked for. Because they do do that. They did show, I remember, uh, I don't know if it was the Paramount panel, they did show logos and designs of oh, titles yeah. for Lots things that they're in. Oh, like that. That's why I can imagine they might have a they might have an announcement trailer for Indy. They might. They you might know, look, something but like all that. I know is we're, we're going to see a lot of cool footage and all that kind of stuff. That's the part that excites me the most is not the trailers, because the trailers they show, they usually do then put up online pretty quickly. It's those 5, 10, 15, 20 minute you know features where yeah they show us like entire scenes and things like that that's the stuff i get most excited about do we know if disney uh, purposely excludes any of the star wars stuff because of celebration or d23 so. remember this is a totally different audience this is the movie theater owners right and a lot of stuff that they show here they do not then put up online for yeah. other things like that so uh, no they won't be this is not a fan event but you know, it's also interesting being there is that like last year, Aaron and I were there and we come out of one of the presentations a couple of times. Well, this one time in particular, a studio exec comes walking up to me and Aaron. We didn't even see the coming and say, you know, I'm not going to say who it was. <laughs> uh, you guys were a little hard on us about this and this and this movie. And we're like, I'm sorry, who are you? And like, oh, I'm so-and-so of such and such company. And Aaron was like, Oh, <laughs> like, oh, that's right. Because, oh, no, you're fair. I just thought maybe you're a little hard on us there for that one. It's like, yeah, but, you know, you put out this other movie that I totally loved. Yeah, yeah, we really liked your coverage. It's just really fun wondering, running into these studio people, and they're like, they know who we are, and they come over to talk to us. That would be funny if you, you said, know, oh, we didn't even do that movie. <laughs> to, to, uh, to Bob Chapek comes up to us. Oh, that would be good. <laughs> to be fair, Jason, Jason, what's your favorite uh, AMC executive? amc you mean adam aaron adam aaron yeah yeah let's see uh, he's gonna be there oh he'll he, be there. Uh, he's speaking oh he's definitely oh, I don't know my if he's god speaking, but he, he'll be there I, well you know i what i really enjoyed was i liked talking to when i was there last time i talked to a lot of independent theater owners that aaron that aaron did that too she said that was her favorite part of it yeah and and just getting the because we forget we talk about our big chains but in a lot of america there aren't the big chains and i was very curious <laughs> And they're very open to talking. And I was, I talked to a lot of them about what is the state of independent theaters, you know, and that was fascinating because I didn't know enough about it. Has anyone ever booed at CinemaCon? <laughs> I, I, well, I already told you, sure. I, I almost got myself thrown out last year. Oh, wow. When Adam Aaron was on stage, I came this close to screaming at him from the, from the audience. Oh, wow. I opted not to, but I, I came very, very close to doing that. So anyway, yeah, there's that. All right, guys.
Question is for you. What are you excited to see from what's coming up at CinemaCon? We just ran down the whole thing. Ray, can you go do something yeah. about that? We just ran down the whole schedule for you about what's coming up and all that kind of stuff. What are you looking forward to hearing coming out of CinemaCon? Are you guys going to be following all of our coverage? Jump on down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to main topic number four, shall we? And our fourth main topic today gets submitted to us by Bruno, who writes, Hey, John. One of my most anticipated movies for this summer is Lightyear, and now we have a new trailer. I loved it. It has all the Pixar feels, but the best thing, of course, is that once again it confirms that the film will be released in theaters. What are your thoughts, and how happy are you that Pixar is returning to the big screen? All right, thanks a lot for sending that in, man. And yeah, this I believe it was this morning, a brand new trailer for Lightyear dropped. Now, the first trailer came out, it was wonderful. It had that that song. Um, I mean, it's just perfect for this. It just felt great. And having Chris Evans doing the voice feels like a seamless transition from Tim. Who who did the voice of uh, what's what's the name? Tim? Uh, you know, uh, Tim uh, Allen. Tim Allen. Uh, it felt Galaxy like a, a seamless transition from Tim Allen to him doing it. I felt great. This new look. New trailer came out. It has some great moments. I don't like it as much as the first trailer. Really? Yeah. I don't like it as much. I, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I disliked it. Don't misquote me. Like, I, I enjoyed it. It was good. And is that Taika Waititi or just somebody they got to sound an awful lot like Taika Waititi in it? Because I, I can't remember if Taika Waititi does a voice in this or not, but I heard that guy. I'm like, that sounds a lot like Taika Waititi. Anyway, it may or may not have been. But... I love that they finally, they gave us a little bit now of the story. Oh, yeah. Buzz takes off, and there's a little bit of a Planet of the Apes. Ta Taika is in it. It is Taika Waititi. Okay, I thought maybe that was, thanks for looking that up, Ray. So he takes off, a little bit of Planet of the Apes, comes back. Now, instead of centuries passing, it's it was 60 years. He thought he was going to be gone for, what did he say, four minutes or four hours? I can't remember. And then he does come back. Turns out he's been gone for whatever. He meets his former commander's granddaughter there's a couple of really good gags in there um again it's a it's a good trailer i liked it i just not losing my mind over it kind of like i did with the first trailer that's me rob you had a chance to see this trailer what do you think about it dude i loved it i mean first of all the design work in this film all of the 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 technology the spacecraft i mean like i said the big the big spherical spacecraft looks like a cross between the aries 1b from 2001 and et spaceship yeah. from et I mean, all his spaceship, all the technology, it, 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 the way this whole movie looks, it's kind of that retro future. It's got that Flash Gordon feel to it. I I was enchanted by this trailer. This movie, this trailer, and, and learning about the plot, totally fascinated by it. Very cool sci-fi story. Love the characters. The gags were legitimately laugh out loud funny. Um, I can't be more excited for this film, dude. It looks so good. Ray, so good. You you watched this trailer. What did you think about it? You know, this trailer actually did the reverse for me. I actually am excited for the movie now after this trailer. Because after the first trailer, I was just like, whatever. But just seeing like the the suits that the the mechanical suits that they were wearing. And um, I don't know, it just seems like a really fun movie. I like the I like that, you know, all the shots of space. I, I'm a I'm a space guy, so anytime you put space somewhere. In a movie, you mean or the moon. space in space? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm on board. Um, you know the just the team thing. You know how I've I've said over and over again. I love when they put a group of di diverse people together to to do something to have some sort of men task. on a mission or men yeah. or women yeah. or men or robot. And and, and, and and the environments look really cool. I, I, I just, really cool. You know, I was never really into the Buzz Lightyear character, but I'm on board for this. It looks you know, great. Rob, one of the big things for a lot of people, though, going into this is like, okay, so there's, is this part of the Toy Story franchise? Is it, is it not? How do you feel like they've been handling this? And do you think taking a Toy Story character, but then making a real movie out of it, do you think this is something that's going to work for them? I, I do. You know, I'm, I'm wondering as somebody who loves, I love canon when they build canon and lore. I'm a big canonista. Um, canonista. A canonista. I wonder, I wonder, like, so in the Toy Story movies, Buzz Lightyear is a toy. Does that mean Buzz Lightyear is based 
on this character that's actually but this character is like from the future like you know not on the same earth so how does it all work together <laughs> like are we, is this going to be revealed at the end that the toy story toy of buzz lightyear is based on this that actually turns out to be a movie in the toy story universe is that what it's going to be like i don't know i don't care it's just awesome and i love the idea behind it i don't know if they're going to tie it in like what if at the end you, it, it, you find out that this is a movie within a movie in the toy story universe oh, I, I would love that i'm like <laughs> that's so cool but otherwise you know what doesn't matter to me if this is a standalone thing on its own I'm there for it because I love retro science fiction. This looks like it's going to give me everything I've ever wanted. Uh, this could be if this this could be wind up being one of my favorite movies of the year. At yeah. least it looks to be that. D didn't we get a shot of like the villain too? Isn't it yeah, Zorg? Zorg. Oh, Zorg, yeah. Zorg yeah. or Zorg, Zorg? And he Zorg. looks like he's going to kick some ass. Yeah, but, but we haven't seen the aliens though yet, right? Or if we not, saw his robots. Yes. His no, robot no, 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 no. The little green ones that are in the claw machine. Uh, no, we, we have not we seen. Have them. I look. wonder if they'll be a part. Uh, They're gonna. Uh, they have to. They have to at least show. I. You know what? I wouldn't be surprised if they did a cameo of that. Now, now here's the thing. What if, as we get into the third act, at some point, the sky rips open and we see Doctor Strange and America Chavez burst through. And go to something else. And they're like, oh, what was that? Eh. Wouldn't surprise me. Wouldn't surprise me at this point. <laughs> Question is for you guys. What did you think about the brand new trailer for Lightyear? Did you like it as much, more, not as much as the last one? Are you excited about the film? Whatever you guys think, jump on down to the comment section below and leave your thoughts there. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to main topic number five. And our fifth main topic today gets submitted to us by The One. And The One writes, I had to shake my head and look again when I saw a story that said Netflix lost over $50 billion in one day and that it could get much worse. Is this something Netflix can recover from? Should the other streaming services be worried at this point? What can Netflix do to turn this around. And that, once again, comes to us from the one. Thanks a lot for writing that, man. And yeah, look, obviously, we talked yesterday on the show about how overnight Netflix loss, it was 25%. 25% of their stock value disappeared overnight. And then it got worse. Then it hit something like 27%. Then it hit 30%. And I think it ended up being about 35%. According to the reports that we got, Netflix lost 35% of their value, their biggest fall since 2004, and lost $54 billion in valuation. $54 billion. Nearly the amount that Disney spent on buying Fox, Netflix lost that overnight. And it could get much, much worse. This comes to us from the folks over at uh, Market Watch who write the following. Netflix Incorporated shares, NFLX, uh, minus 2.69% for the day, slid another 4% pre-market on Thursday. That's today. Continuing the route that was sparked by its weaker-than-expected first quarter earnings that showed it's losing subscribers for the first time since its infancy and a forecast for a loss of 2 million more subscribers in the current quarter. The stock slid 35.1% Wednesday to mark its steepest single-day percentage decline since it fell a record 40.9% on October 15th of 2004. Netflix avoided closing with a market share below $100 billion, but it still shed a stunning $54.3 billion in market capitalization on the day. According to Dow Jones market data, David Trainer, CEO of New Construct, says that the stock, get this, could fall another 50%. It could fall another 50%. Now, there are a couple things we should keep in mind, though. Is Netflix doomed? I want to remind everybody about something. Netflix still has over 200 million subscribers worldwide. Their monthly revenue, not profit, but revenue, their monthly revenue is in excess of 
of three billion dollars a month. A lot of that is eaten up by expenses. But still, when you are a company that generates three billion dollars in revenue a month, you've got options. <laughs> you're okay. For now, you're okay. That is not meant to try to sugarcoat just how bad this is and just how much this hurt. $54 billion in valuation gone overnight, 35% stock drop, and some of their analysts saying this could drop another 50%. And Rob, it might have either been you or Aaron yesterday, I can't remember, who pointed out that when you're an Apple or you're an Amazon or Aaron. you're a Disney... You have a lot of other things to fall back up on and absorb those kind of losses when things like that happen because you have many other outlets to your business. Amazon makes its billions not from Amazon Prime. They make their billions just being Amazon. Apple makes their billions from their hardware and their software. Disney makes their billions from parks and travel you know, and, and their studios and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, hey, listen, if Disney Plus suffers for a bit, Netflix hasn't got anything else. They are Netflix, and that is it. And when that hurts, they got nothing else to back them up with. They got Netflix games coming, you but know. They do have Netflix games, which a lot of people are excited about. A lot of people really? are excited about. I, yeah, I've read a lot of people excited about, it. and I've also read some skepticism from people online about it. But there's a lot of potential there if you're a Netflix because you're you've mastered this entire format of stuff, right? So if you can bring games into that loop, you could be something special. But we'll see how that all pans out. But Rob, I don't think it's an over-exaggeration to say this is tragic for Netflix. This is cataclysmic. Because when the drop happened yesterday, I half thought that, eh, you know what, though, overnight we could see that. We've seen other big stocks rebound really quickly, but this morning they didn't. And they're now forecasting maybe even bigger losses. So, Rob, let me put throw the question over to you. How big of a deal is this for Netflix? And is this something they can recover from quickly? Is it something, or is this just the beginning? I don't know. What do you think about this? Oh, I look. First of all, I I, I like to qualify my statements by saying I am by no means an economic expert at all. But I would, and, and that said, I would say I don't think ultimately in the history of Netflix this will be an interesting footnote, because here's the thing, John. There's only a finite amount of people on this planet. There's only a finite amount of households that are going to have access to streaming services in the first place. So at some point, and why they don't think about it in these kind of terms, it's going to be like the newspaper business. Eventually, the newspapers in a certain town, there are no more people that are going to subscribe to that newspaper because they've all done so. All the people that want to subscribe, you know, people move. But for the most part, the subscription base, that's what they got. That's what's there. Eventually, all the streamers are going to have this... It's, there's only the same pool of people streaming shows. So uh, all streaming services are going to hemorrhage people. They're going to they're, they're churn and burn. People are going to leave for a while. They're going to come back. But for the most part, you're going to have a stability there of people that are going to have these streaming services based on the economic factors. We've got a lot of inflation. It's not surprising, especially they lost a lot of viewers in the UK where they're particularly hard hit by, by all of these prices. So... I think eventually what these streamers have to do is not worry about massive growth. What you're going to have to do is figure out a way to become stable in terms of how much money you're going to spend based on your get, like you said, John, $3 billion a month. That's a pretty nice check cash flow right there. What they're going to have to do is not spend 100 to 150% of their income on new programming. They're going to have to bring it down and figure out how to spend 30 to 50% of their income and stabilize that. And when they have gaming, they'll have microtransactions in the game. John, they're going to add, I hate to say it, they're going to add lower tiers with ads. They're going to do it. It's going to happen. And then you're going to be more of a basic cable network and things are going to change around. And I, I will always subscribe to Netflix at the higher tier. I don't think this the sky is falling here yet. I think this was a correction that is was going to happen and they're going to weather this storm and it's going to be fine. And their stock price, I don't know where it closed. I don't think the market's closed yet, but but we'll see where it goes. I think for the time being, this is a little rough, but I'll tell you this. If I had a lot of disposable income, if I hadn't just uh, gotten in, got, got into the housing market, I would invest in Netflix. So right now, I just brought up on screen here our look at uh, Netflix stock. Uh, 
for like less than 48 hours ago it was at 348 dollars now as of this moment it's 215 dollars bro i'd buy some <sighs> now it should also be noted that a couple of the the bigger higher profile billionaires who are like big stock investors just dumped all of their netflix stock they they decided they didn't see a future in it some people in the industry are saying this is a reflection of the fact that netflix has always been overvalued they're seeing that this might that be too. seen as a market correction that maybe we're seeing not maybe a big free fall but rather a market correction, like maybe they're realizing, okay, Netflix with all of its whatever, it's not actually worth $155 billion. It's worth Plus, this much. They're going into new markets. Like if they were to go into China, they're not in China. If they were to go into China somehow and the, 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 the Chinese communist government would let them in, there's another big growth factor. But the fact is Netflix can only grow to a certain point. And then there's no more growth to be had, just like a newspaper. What, what they have to do is figure out how to maximize profits by spending less money on content and make revenue elsewhere and stabilize their business. It, it's un, uh, Growth will end, and this is going to happen. I mean, it's not like Netflix makes something like a plane or a train that had a catastrophic failure and fell out of the sky or derailed. They haven't done anything different. Netflix is still doing exactly what they did a week ago. So this whole thing, it's all part of market forces and earnings and whatever. But eventually, this was going to happen. All right, guys. Question is for you. What do you think about the Netflix drop? $54 billion they lost overnight. It seems to be steadying out right now. Like, I mean, it hasn't recovered at all, but at least it doesn't seem to be dropping anymore at the moment. But some analysts are saying it could drop another 50%. What do you guys think about that? What do you think the causes are? Do you think it, does it shake you as a Netflix subscriber? Does it make you want to not subscribe or anything? I, I'm a very happy Netflix subscriber myself, but whatever you guys think, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. Okay, guys, with all that down, we're now going to move over and start taking your live questions. We have just opened the Super Chats, so you can start firing them in, and we'll start answering them in just a moment once we hear from a word from our last sponsor here today, the great folks over at Keeps. Hey, guys, we want to take a minute and thank the sponsor of today's video, the good folks at Keeps. Now, look, you guys probably already know that two out of every three men will experience some form of hair loss by the time they're just 35 years old. Now, that's where Keeps comes in because Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors. That means the guys that use it love it. Keeps offers a simple, affordable, and stress-free way to keep your hair. It's also low cost. Treatments start as low as just $10 per month, and Keeps offers generic versions for the two FDA-approved medications to prevent hair loss. That means treatment plans are affordable, typically half the cost of pharmacy prices. Keeps has everything your hair needs, delivered straight to your door with discreet packaging and proven results. Remember, prevention is the key. Treatments can take four to six months to see results, so the sooner you act, the better. When it comes to your hair, save more, spend less with Keeps. So if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to Keeps, that's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Campia to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's Keeps, K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Campia to get your first month free. Keeps dot com slash Campia. And a big special thank you to the folks over at Keeps for sponsoring this episode of the John Campia Show. Remember, guys, Right down in the description, you'll see a link to all of the great sponsors who are making this show possible. Go check them out because you are supporting us by doing it. All right, guys. With that all down, let's jump on over and start taking your live comments and questions, shall we? We are going to start things off here with... Are we in the right spot? We are in the right spot. Okay. Uh, Jake Thiessen just sends in a Super Chat badge to be supportive. Thank you, Jake. Appreciate that very much, man. Next up, we got Andy who writes... Love Tom Hanks. I shouldn't be surprised, but I'm disappointed by the amount of stupid and hateful people today who still think Hanks did stupid stuff. I tell you what, it, the whole Tom, you've heard the Tom Hanks stuff, right? If you want to tell somebody you're a blithering moron without saying you're a blithering moron, repeat that stupid Tom Hanks stuff. Like, that's how you, that's how you can identify a blithering moron <laughs> in this world, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Uh, second chance from disaster. And, oh, shit. I got to turn off the super chats. We're way over the mark already. Sorry. Give me a second, guys. 
How to turn off the super chats? Okay. Seconds from disaster rights. We have now, unfortunately, guys, had to close down the super chats. Thank you, guys. Everybody sent them in. You filled them up. Let's get to them here. Seconds from disaster rights. Um, one of three. Episode four of Moon Knight was great, but I have no clue what's real anymore. On the surface, it seems Rob's theory was right, but nothing so far has been what it. Um. Let's see. Has been what it looks like on the surface. Do you think the end is another misdirect? Uh, why waste the whole intro of this episode showing us all the imprisoned gods? Um, uh, if it wasn't real, maybe episodes one through three are memories of, of and the drugs are making him forget the details or so replace them with the people and things around him. All right. So we it's been now a, a couple of days since Moon Knight came out. We can talk about this. And obviously, Paul, I did put up on the on the channel yesterday, guys, in the community section that we weren't able to do an open spoiler discussion yesterday. So our apologies for that. So, yeah, I mean, the ending that we saw of Moon Knight was... I, I, I think you're going to agree with me, Rob. The ending we saw on Moon Knight, that wasn't real. No. Um, so I don't know what's happening. I, I, know, I know that the the hippo, the god hippo showing up at the end freaked me out. No doubt that the other sarcophagus, that was the third personality, right? Like in that third sarcophagus, could, could right? Could very well be. I mean, look, I think all of this, everything that we've seen so far, there's a little bit of reality in it. And a little bit of not. And and this this whole waking up in the asylum thing, like none of that's real. It's again, there's aspects of reality in there, but I think they're gonna the reason they didn't show we're gonna find out what is real in the next two episodes. Uh I agree. All right, let's keep going on here. Next, thanks for sending that in seconds from disaster. Next up, Jay Bling writes. Uh, two-part question. If Netflix is unable to operate on its own for much longer, do you think they will seek some sort of corporate buyout? Um, and then... And secondly, do you think any major corporation would take Netflix since it would be a pre-existing streaming service operating at a loss? Well, remember this. Netflix has oper operated at a loss almost its entire existence. I mean, it wasn't until last year that they actually turned a profit. Like, despite the fact that they generate three, three billion, three plus billion dollars a month, last year they generated their first profit. I mean, so there's that. And this whole notion of, though, they can't go much longer. Listen, Netflix, I don't know what's going to happen long term, but Netflix right now, today, is far from being on its last legs. Like far, far it's from it. Business as usual, aside from their stock price. Well, I mean, no, no. I mean, what they what happened in the last forty eight hours is not business as usual. Well, no, but in terms but, of their operations, yeah. you know, it's not like somebody's going, "Okay, we're sending you all home, goodbye." But they lost, what was it, one tenth of one percent of their subscribers. That two hundred thousand losses of subscribers, I think, is like out of the two hundred million they have. I believe that's like one tenth of one percent. So they are far from being on their last legs. And their valuation is still over $100 billion. There's only one company that could probably buy them, and that's Apple. <laughs> I, I, I don't even think, at 100, no, I take that back. I mean, Amazon could probably buy them as well. Disney definitely couldn't. Like, Disney had to leverage almost every dollar they were worth to go ahead and buy Fox. I mean, they, they, they're not in a position that they could buy them. So, but I don't see anybody buying them right now. Rob, do you? No, I don't either, but it would be pretty interesting if Apple did. And <laughs> Netflix ceases to exist and it's just Apple plus. It's just Apple plus. All right. Uh, next up, uh, we've got, uh, Marksman AZ who writes new show title show friends on show business. That's actually not terrible. <laughs> that's, that's not a terrible title right there. Marksman. I like that one. Thanks for putting that. You in. have to license that though. You would definitely have to license that. All right. Pablo Zagino writes, uh, watch the Prince of Egypt this past Easter Sunday. Honestly, one of my favorite and most underrated, uh, underrated animated films, amazing visuals and animation. I quite like the Prince of Egypt. I do too. There's a, there's, I've talked about this before, but there's a great song in it that, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the actor, the, the guy from Lethal Weapon, uh, not not uh, <laughs> not Mel not Gibson. Mel Gibson, not Danny Glover, Danny Glover, Danny, Danny Glover doing the voice of one of the characters, and 
he doesn't sing the song, yeah. but his character sings a song. It's a it's a marvelous song that I think is actually one of the most beautiful songs I've ever seen in a movie. It's called Look at Your Life Through Heaven's Eyes. And it's a beautiful, beautiful song. So I, I like that movie a lot, man. I'm glad you saw it. All right, next up, we got Elizabeth Gerardo who writes in. Uh, Disney, James Gunn fired for tweets that he already apologized for. Warner Brothers, Ezra Miller, choked a girl, gets erratic at a karaoke bar, assaults a couple, throws a chair at a woman, injuring her. Warner Brothers, we got you. <laughs> I, I, I mean, no, it's, it's, it's true, but here's the funny thing. My big frustration with Warner Brothers at the time over this was, and again, I cannot remember the guy's name, but the guy who played a elongated man on Flash. Oh, yeah. Right? He, he was great on that show. And what happened with him was some tweets reemerged that he had written out like five years earlier, and they were completely out of taste. I mean, make no mistake. The tweets that he put out were poor form, totally in terrible taste. Absolutely. But they were jokes. And Warner Brothers decided instant fire. And they fired him and they kicked him off the show and they took the character off the show and all that kind of stuff. Instant fire. And I'm like, hey, listen, if that's you, how you want to handle it, that's your prerogative. I have no problem with that, that they decided to fire him. I would have had no problem if they decided to keep him. But within a week or two weeks, it felt like, that Ezra Miller thing happened where Ezra Miller was caught on tape outside of a club drunk as hell, grabbing a girl by the throat and taking her to the ground. The video didn't have him punching her in the face or anything, but still. And that, no problem. My frustration with Warner Brothers was the rampant inconsistency. Like, I would have been cool if they decided to keep them both on. I would have been cool if they decided to fire them both on the spot. But the fact that one guy who they rediscovered tweets he had written long before he ever worked with them, <laughs> right? fired instantly, guy caught physically assaulting somebody, assaulting a woman, no problem. I mean, it, it's that inconsistency. I don't look for Warner Brothers to be consistent with what other studios are doing, but just be consistent within yourself. And that's, that's the part that bothered me about it. Anyway, that's just kind of my take. All right, next up. Uh... Battlefield Earth is better than Star Trek, right? <laughs> Michael Bay could make a star could Michael Bay could make Star Trek watchable. I'll tell you what. Michael Bay, if you if you want to do a Star Trek movie that was a Star Trek movie based in wartime. Michael Bay could make a thrilling Star Trek movie. I I I, I don't think I don't think against that. But well, I will I will come to Rob's defense here. Battlefield Earth is not better than Star Trek. <laughs> I'm just going to say that. Well, right I mean, now. also, look, J.J. Abrams' Star Trek 09 looks great. I mean, despite all the... Make a lot lens, of lens flares. Lot lens, for jo lens flare jokes all you want and the horrible design of the starships and all that, but that's just a personal taste thing. Um, form over function, but it still looks good. You know, there's a lot of... There's a lot of... it's Star Trek is something that lives and dies by the writing. And and that's what I'm a fan of. And when Star Trek began back in the 60s, the people that were writing the scripts were well-known fantasists of the day. They wrote novels, they wrote plays, they wrote short stories, and they also wrote television, and not just Star Trek. And that's it's all about the writing for me. All right, next up. I did read the novel Battlefield Earth, though, and I quite liked it. Oh, yeah, which is a far cry from the... Movie. movie uh james argento writes uh disney panel prediction uh the full indie five title uh I, I wouldn't be surprised if they just gave us the full title uh, that yep. i would believe that i could believe that uh dr strange Lightyear, and thor footage absolutely um info about animated films strange world and fantastic four cast maybe i don't think they'll give us a fantastic four cast i think that movie is still a little wouldn't uh, they save that for like D23 or, or Yeah, something like that would be D20. Like if, if Or they would do their own Marvel one of those yeah. presentations in if, the theater. If Fantastic 4 was coming out within the next 12 months, they could absolutely do that at D23. It's not so I don't expect that. But I think we're going to see chunks of Doctor Strange. 
Uh, I think we're out in chunks of Thor. So, and I, you know, if Doctor Strange is in the Illuminati, I mean, uh, uh, Reed Richards is part of the Illuminati, and whoever's playing Reed Richards also plays Reed Richards in a Fantastic Four movie. Maybe they'll do something with it. Never know. All right. Next up, we've got uh, Andy who writes. I really wanted to see the Batman hit 800 million at the worldwide box office, but Warner Brothers uh, going out of their way to market it to market it on HBO Max. Good rid riddance to Jason Kalar. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it's not like if they had waited another 15 days and made it a 60 day release window. It's not like Batman would have made a billion dollars. But Batman still, it's a three-hour movie. It did very, very well. Make no mistake. Very well. And it would have been making more money in the last week had people not known, oh, it's just going to be on HBO Max in a couple of days. Yeah. But I don't know it that it would have made $50 million difference. Maybe 10, maybe $15 million difference, which is still 10 to $15 million that they just burned. But still, I mean, it's not like it would have gotten it to 800 either way. I mean, you never know. You never know. But I, I don't think it would have gotten to 800. It still did really good on its own, though. All right. Thanks a lot for sending that in, Andy. White Hawk writes, What if Lightyear is the first movie of a grand plan to make real movies about their Toy Story characters? Woody might be next, and they, they could be connected. I don't see in any reality how a Lightyear movie set way in the future would be connected to a Woody movie set in the West. No, I don't, I, see, I don't see how that could happen. But I'll tell you this. I would love to see a Western made by Pixar that starred Woody. But would they? I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, if, if this is... They don't have to be connected. But, but like, I, I, I don't know how that's going to work. I don't need continuity, but I would love to see a Pixar Western. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you this, though. You got a little Western feel in Cars, <laughs> but I'd love to see a Pixar Western, dude. I'll tell you this. Lightyear makes six hundred million at the box office. There's going to be a Woody movie. I'll, I'll go on record right now and say that if if Lightyear makes six hundred million, there will be a Woody movie. Like Garrett, I'm not, and I'm not saying there won't be one if it doesn't hit six hundred. If it makes like two hundred million, I guarantee you there won't be any other Toy Story movies. You know, could, like, Pixar's Forgiven, the Woody movie. Pixar's Slinky Dog race I'd movie. I'd see that. <laughs> I'd see that. The Adventures of Slink. <laughs> totally see it. Or Forky. Bo Peep. Bo Peep. Make an R-rated erotic Army thriller Man. with Bo Peep. <laughs> R-rated erotic thriller. All right. Okay. Next up, we've got Sam Fisher who writes, uh, because it was Passover, I watched Prince of Egypt so good. Uh, one of my favorites, whenever I invite Goy, non-Jews, to Passover, I show them this movie. I have never heard the term Goy. Oh, you haven't? No. The Goyim. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I'm, I'm your Goyim? Is that what it is? Yeah, you, 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 all of you. You're all Goyim. All okay. of you. <laughs> all right. Uh, next up, we got Mike. But that Thomas. doesn't mean, that's not bad. Yeah, okay. it's not derogatory. It just means you're not as chosen as we are. Oh, much. okay. Yeah, it's, it's the time we call our, our non-Italian friends Mungies. So I don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. Uh, my Comic Planet writes, Game day. Can't wait to see the Northman tonight. Me too. I'm going to go see the Northman tonight. Watch for my out of the theater reaction. I'm very stoked about it. John, will you be doing an out of the theater reaction tonight? <laughs> oh, damn right I am. Damn right I am. It, it now that, like I said, now that Batman is in my rearview mirror, the Northman, at least for the next few hours, is my number one most anticipated movie of the year. Cannot wait. So I'm going to go see that tonight. I'll give you a full report of it. Uh, at, with my out of the theater reaction a little bit later. All right, Sin Vendetta writes, uh, one of two, speaking of Lord of the Rings, a marathon I do every year. I watch the Hobbit trilogy extended editions, then the Lord of the Rings trilogy extended editions. Um, and Did you say he does that on a weekend? I, uh, yeah, I can't keep searching That's for That's a it. long weekend. Uh, that is a very, very long weekend, <laughs> but, but a good one nonetheless. Listen, I... I honestly, I think the weakest of the Hobbit films was the final one because even though it has fantastic action and things like that, the problem is the third movie is a great third act to a full movie, but the entire movie is just all payoff with no setup. They forget that it's been like at that point when we have the big, for example, I always go to this one. When they have the big confrontation between Thor and Oakenshield, 
and the white orc, who I forget the name of the orc. But when they have that big confrontation, there's no emotional punch to it because it's like the filmmakers forgot. We haven't seen these two on screen together in two years. So where it's supposed to be this big, oh, now we fight. It's like, oh, yeah, we haven't even seen you on screen together in years. And that's the problem. Like, I mean, I still remember when I was at CinemaCon and the news came out that the Hobbit movies had changed from a two-film series to a yeah. three-film series, to which all of us said, channeling Chris Carr, for why? <laughs> what what how on earth do you stretch out the hobbit into three films and you really felt that in the third film because there's, it, it, it was just all payoff with no setup unless you're consider things that you saw last year and two years ago set up i mean it just made no sense but i still believe overall the hobbit trilogy gets a bad rap I, I I enjoy those films. I like watching those films. Are they anywhere near as good as the original Lord of the Rings films? No, obviously not. But I still think they're good films. I don't know. What do you think about the, the Hobbit trilogy? I think there's a lot of good stuff in them. My problem is the tone. You know, the thing about the Hobbit movies is they're, from scene to scene, they're wildly divergent in tone. Sometimes you've got slapstick humor, and other times you've got real peril. And the design, you know, it, it it leans more heavily into full CG characters. A lot of the goblin stuff gets really goofy. The physics in the movie are, are the movies are questionable. And I understand they embrace that goofiness. To uh, the Hobbit is much more of a children's book than Lord of the Rings is. So that's my problem: is it's just wildly inconsistent in tone, and it doesn't create, well, dare I say it, the verisimilitude that the Lord of the Rings did for me. Oh, and I'll tell you this much. In the first Hobbit movie, one of my favorite scenes of all the Tolkien movies, out of all the Lord of the Rings movies too, is in Bilbo's house. The dwarves are there. First of all, when the dwarves show up and they start singing about breaking dishes and blah, blah, that's what Bilbo Baggins hates, right? I was just teleported back to me as a kid when I used to read The Hobbit. Like, that was right out of my imagination. But one of my favorite scenes in all of them is a simple scene. They're in the they're in Bilbo's house, and Thorne starts singing the song about the Misty Mountains. Through dungeons deep and the Misty Mountains call. Like, right? I, that scene, there's something so powerful about that because I had read the books, and I, I know what they're singing about, right? I... Love that scene. Yeah. So my and then I also love the barrels, the barrel scene, which is a scene I'd always imagined as a kid, right? I thought the barrel scene was great. Uh, yeah, I thought they did again, nowhere near as good as Lord of the Rings, but I I, I thought that it had its uh it had its upsides. All right. Big D Studios writes. One of two. Uh unpopular opinion, but in my uh in my IMPO, you probably just mean in my personal opinion. There it is. Yeah. I admittedly know. Uh, the Fast franchise hasn't always been steady, to say the least. However, I'm a huge Fast fan, and my mindset is this. For any film, bad or good... Oh, we got to go looking for it here. Give me a second. For any film, bad or good... And... We'll just have to get to it when we come around. I, I can't keep... I can't I can't spend 30 seconds searching for it. Sorry about that. But hey, listen, you know... We'll, we'll wait till we get to a second part there to, to get to that. But yeah, look, Fast and Furious franchise absolutely has some diehard fans. I am not, here's the thing though, Rob, I'm not a, I'm a fan of everything you do no matter what. Right. No, no way. Not Star Wars, not MCU, not DCU. Like I'm a fan, but being a fan means I can acknowledge that they do something that I don't like and still be a fan. Right? Like, too many people have this idea that if you're a fan of something, that means you have to love everything. No, that's not true at all. I'm a fan of the Toronto Maple Leafs. I'll tell you absolutely everything wrong with them. And I have my whole life. I'm a huge fan of Star Wars, but I don't like everything coming out of Star Wars. Me neither. Dude, I'm, I'm that way with Star Trek, too. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of bad Star Trek. I'll but there's call it. Also, nothing wrong if there's something about the Fast and Furious franchise that you just love in its DNA. And there's nothing like I hate nine, but if you loved nine, you love nine. That's yeah. great. I mean, you know me, and there's not a bigger. Fa I love the Fast and Furious franchise. I too hated nine, 
because it went off the rails literally and and it wasn't it ceased to be what it was that i loved and i think that they made mistakes and it was justin lynn coming back and there was really no justice for han they retconned the idea that there doesn't need to be justice for han now and i'm like well that's dumb (laughs) why'd you do that all right big d we'll see if you were able to get your second part in there all right next up we got jay master who writes, uh, sends in a $50 super chat. Thank you, Jay, for supporting us on that level, man. Go, Jay. Um, Jay Master writes, Hey, John, I read on Screen Rant yesterday, Hawkeye actress uh, Alqua Cox teased that Marvel Studios' Disney Plus Echo starts production today. Also, I do believe Disney will show some footage of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, which comes out in May 23rd of 2023. Oh, then yeah. I would look, I don't know how much footage they'll show us. But I think at the very least, we'll get a title card. Sure. We'll get some announcements. Maybe even James Gunn be there to talk about, you know, in May, we got our new... Th- I mean, I, I wouldn't be totally surprised by that at all. Uh, as far as Echo starting production, I mean, that's significant to me because I, I started to believe that the Echo show wasn't even real. I started to believe the Echo show was a placeholder for something else the tangibilization as you say but the tangibilization it's real rob what do you think about that they've started production i i I didn't know that but that makes sense to me but then again that's that's a series it's not a movie yes so you know but i think it's great i but but the that's i i want to see that i love that character from the comics and that's uh, the echo series is one of going to be one of the things that why disney plus is out there so they could like um, create these series about these unknown characters that they're just they never would have made a movie about. And they're right. just expanding the Marvel universe, and we can all appreciate that. Whether we like the series or not, we get a new character instead of just keep doing the same character. It's it's someone different. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, her I character like is completely different. My, my one thing though is that now look, unpopular opinion. I'm not a fan of the Hawkeye series. I didn't hate it. I didn't hate it. There are certain episodes I really liked, but. They, I don't feel like they did themselves any favors with the Echo character because they should have used Hawkeye to really put Echo over with us. And honestly, and this wasn't the performer's fault. This wasn't her fault at all. It's just the way the, the show was written. I didn't think they made me go, man, I can't wait to see a show about that character. No, it's they true. did a bad job of that. So I, I hope the show's good. I hope it's really good. And obviously, we've been hearing that uh Vincent D'Onofrio is going to be in it we've been hearing Charlie Cox is probably going to be in it so let's see how it goes all right uh thanks so much for saying that in J Master appreciate that very much and again thank you for supporting us on that level dude that's really generous of you all right next up we got Ben Rayner who writes uh over under 25 percent Tim Allen cameos in Lightyear I'll go over 25 percent that we hear his voice in it at some point I'll go over yeah, 25%. that sounds good. I, I'll buy that. I don't think I'd go over 50%, but I'll go over. To, I'll take the over on 25 on that, Ben. Uh, Ismail Montoya writes, uh, Hey, John, and wow, what a twist. Did you notice that after Mark was shot, as he's sinking, the bullet wounds are gone? Uh, can it mean he's sinking into a form of afterlife? Well, I don't know if you mean the bullet wounds are gone when he wakes, when he quote unquote wakes up uh, for whatever that is. I, or when he's falling or right. or yeah I'm, see you can't you can't look at that stuff literally of course there's no bullet holes because none of this is exactly what we're seeing see, i still think and i we may find out next week that i'm totally wrong about this and i won't be shocked if i am i still think everything we've seen into the show up until he wakes up in the asylum i think everything we've seen in the show has actually happened and is actually real and what we're seeing now is more like a Star Trek The Next Generations thing where yeah, yeah. They, they, they think they're waking up and the world is different than they remember it, but that's all a lie. That's, that's what I think is happening here, but I could be dead wrong about that. Yeah, I think there's a com- kind of a combination of the two. Yeah, you're probably right. It's probably some kind of combination. All right, thanks a lot for sending that in, Ismail. Next up, Devin uh, Pangrakar writes, Name suggestions. Council of Cinephiles. Again, I don't want anything movie specific in the title, so right. there's that. Uh, Council of Cinephiles. Screenalytics. You know what? That's that's kind of you know me right. I, I forgot to bring that up to you. Like someone said that in the chat. I, f- I think their name started with D. Uh, Dev. Dev. What is, who wrote that in? This is Devin. Oh yeah, yeah. He said that in the chat yesterday. I just completely forgot to bring it up to you. I thought it was 
I thought that it was a good name too. You know, here's the thing. I, Screenalytics to me, maybe not as a show title, as a segment title though. Yeah. Screenalytics sounds like a great segment title for looking at the box office. Mm -hmm. The Screenalytics. Yeah, something, something of I like that. Like I, it I, can't I gotta, be a classroom segment, but yeah, dealing or, with. Yeah, or a classroom. I, like, I will, I'm going to keep Netflix, that in mind, Devin. The Netflix story today would have been a great screen analytics. A screen analytics thing. That's true. All right. Thanks for the suggestion. I'm going to keep that in mind. Or also, you mentioned Papa John's The Movie Edition. No, probably not. All right. Uh, Random Andy's Channel writes, I'm with Rob on physical media. I bought the Godfather Coda digital, and it replaced my copy of the theatrical cut. I can't find it anywhere now. At least I have my physical copy Fist bump, Rob. <laughs> well, look, we're going to see a lot of that. There's going to be a lot of 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 movies that are replaced or movies that are not so, you know, a lot of cult titles, a lot of titles that don't have a big audience. They will disappear from streaming platforms because people don't watch them. And the argument can be made, then why do they need to be there in the first place? And I would say because they're part of cinema history. All right. Next up, Andrew Poor writes. Hey, John, so excited to hear about your coverage of CinemaCon. Looking forward to what you tell us. I am so stoked. You know what? I think, Ray, you went with me, I think, twice to CinemaCon. And then right. I Rob went, went with me once. And then Aaron went with me last year. This is the first year I'm going with a team. Like, this yeah, is the man. first year I'm going with more than one your person. Your strike team. Is your strike team assembled? This is the alpha team right here. I'm very, very excited about that. I think we're going to have a blast. We're taking, we're taking your shuttle tesla by the way today. yeah we are we're gonna take the tesla out there what was chris carr's what's chris carr's alternate personality oh, yeah, name her again? drunk her drunk her personality dr guys in the oh, live God. chat do you remember when she said her drunken personality's name is the the evil version of herself yeah uh, yeah I forgot, i'm I interested in meeting this girl i'm interested in meeting this girl if any of you guys can remember the name she she said the name of her character is mm. i'd like to see it uh, and yeah super stoked for CinemaCon. i look forward to this every single year all right uh, next up, we've got, uh, thanks for sending that in, Andrew. Al Renshaw writes, hey, John, so excited to hear about your coverage. No, that we're going to do that. Al Renshaw writes, I need to find me a woman that looks at me the way Rob looks at and eats cinema, uh, cinnamon saltwater taffy, LOL. <laughs> I'm assuming there's a story there. My favorite candy of all time is cinnamon saltwater taffy from Bruce's Candy Kitchen. Not all saltwater taffy, specifically cinnamon. My friend... Lori Schertz, who's the producer of Crisis Medicine, sent me a bag of it in the mail. And yesterday, on my porch, I ate a piece of it. I showed it. It's on John. If you followed me on Instagram, which well, which I don't, you, you I, should. You would have been able to see. I didn't even know you had an Instagram until yesterday. You would have been able to see. I made a video of me eating a piece of cinnamon saltwater taffy from Bruce's Candy Kitchen. By the way. Go to brucescandy.com. They do not sponsor the show. I sponsor them. I have my whole life. No apostrophe. Brucescandy.com. Order a bunch of cinnamon saltwater taffy and say Rob Burnett said so and see if what will happen. Maybe and, they'll uh, send me free sh cinnamon saltwater taffy. They should sponsor our thing here. There we go. They All should. right. Next up, we got... Oh, what's up, Ray? A lot of people are saying, like, was it Chrissy Denicio? That's mm, it! Mm. Or That's Christine Denicio? Yeah, Somebody Dr. Denicio. Dr. J Denicio, that was and it. Ron H. I think she said Christy Denicio Something comes like, out. Yeah, yeah. I want to meet Christy Denicio. I think Christy Denicio and Aaron Cummings would have uh, would wreak havoc in Do you Vegas. like cinnamon, John, by the way? I'm going to bring you a piece. I like cinnamon rolls. Is that the same thing? No, this is a different thing. It's a lot of people don't like cinnamon candy. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not a big cinnamon. I'm person. a huge Elizabeth. Every my entire life, people said you only like cinnamon candy because no one else likes it. And you don't have to share. And I'm like, that is not true. <laughs> but that's that, that's a that's a fringe benefit though. Hot tamales are my all time favorite movie candy. Cinnamon saltwater taffy is my all time favorite. If only from Bruce's Candy Kitchen though, because people are always trying to send it to me. I'm like, it's nice that you've sent it to me from some place on the East Coast. That's not what I'm. It's looking. not the that, same. I'm the same way with Boston cream donuts. In that, like, people hear that my favorite donut is a Boston cream donut. And then some people, some well meaning people, then it's like, oh, hey, I got you a Boston cream donut. It's like, mm, you don't understand. Like, Tim Hortons, you only get this if you're Canadian. Tim Hortons makes the world's only Boston cream donut, as far as I'm concerned. They are the only, better than anything you'll get in Boston, the Tim Hortons Boston cream donut is the most delicious donut I've ever had. I, I just, you, you know, I know. So much. You, you, I get it from the one place. You, you know what the best uh, candy is for me right now is the Australian licorice, the Aussie licorice. It's the really thick ones that we buy <gasps> Ooh, I like that, that are that super stuff. soft, like the green apple. Ooh. Ooh, I'd like to try that. I like nice soft licorice. Yeah, me too. Great. 
All right. Sorry. We, we got to keep going. We're getting behind here. All right. <laughs> Thanks for that, Sam. Uh, or what's that? No, that was Ann Renshaw. Sam Fisher writes, can I petition for the first non-Marvel DC slash Star Wars after show to be the offer? Uh, if it's good. Uh, it is about ob it is about objectively one of the greatest movies of all time. No such thing as an objectively thing at all. So get that out of there. It's true. I no. don't think we will do an after show for the offer because honestly and unfortunately, I don't think a ton of people are going to watch it. And um, I am very much excited about doing our first non Marvel DC or Star Wars after show. Because we've well, that's all we've done on the John Campus show so far. Star Trek: Strange New Worlds. I, I mean, maybe, maybe I'll tell you what though. If we had already been in the new studio, we would be doing one for Winning Time. Right. That's for sure. We should have done one for Severance. But once we get moved into the new studio, we'll start looking at stuff like that. All right, thanks for that, Sam. Next up, our friend Connie Sang writes. Hey, Connie. Hello, Connie. Uh, looking forward to the Northman in Dolby tonight. I am also looking forward to the Northman in Dolby tonight. Uh, also for Vegas, uh, go to Ghost Donkey at the Cosmopolitan for mezcal and nachos. What is um, that? Uh, uh, a fine drop to drink and uh, nachos. That sounds good for me. I wish yeah. Connie was coming out with us to uh, CinemaCon. Connie, hop in, hop in a car, drive out, come meet us one night, hang out. At, uh, I've only ever been in the Cosmo twice, and both times was to play poker. It is gorgeous, though. Yeah, it's too... Uh, I seem very not welcome <laughs> i'm just kidding i'm kidding it just it, that place is so high class like i don't want to watch it's, it's very classy very very classy place so uh, maybe we'll see it's named after iconic. a very classy magazine all right next up bailey fuller writes uh went and saw everything everywhere all at once on tuesday after begging my local cinema to show it it was a roller coaster and strangely had an urge to eat a bagel <laughs> i know that reference uh love from australia Listen again, guys, as of right now, as of today, to me, Everything Everywhere All at Once is the best movie of the year, hands down. And I talked to somebody, I got a call from somebody the other day who's kind of involved with the movie and told me a wild story about, about how it came to be. Hopefully, I will be able to tell that story sometime soon because it is kind of crazy, but it is a dynamically awesome movie i'm glad you went to go see it bailey because this movie deserves to make all the money uh let's see let's see. next up where are we at here uh here to watch writes hope everything everywhere all at once is still out on mother's day i'll take my mom i hope so too hey listen last week it did one of the rarest things in box office it went up from week one to week two you're doing good if your movie only drops 50%. If your movie drops 50%, that's a really good second week. Yep. Everything Everywhere All Once went up. So let's hope to keep that trend going, man. All right. Stubble McShave writes, Suggestion show name, The Screen Reflection. That's not bad. I'll tell you the one that I liked the most. The one I liked the most was one that not a lot of people liked, unfortunately, so I went against it. It was Must Watch. Must Watch. It's, I love that name. It's short. It's got punch to it. And it, it kind of, it covers TV and movies. And I really loved it. Actually, you know, our one of my business associates who kind of helps me with the business end of thing of the John Campion show, buddy of mine named Scott, he, uh, he owns that name. And he offered to let us have it. Must watch. I loved it, but and I was really surprised as I started to run it by people, people in this room included, my yep. own wife included. I was kind of surprised when I started running it by some people, and uh, and they said, eh, it's all right. I'm like, oh, I was so disappointed because I thought I found the name, but nobody else bought into it. You know what the name is going to be? The Ray Ora Show? And the Blockade. <laughs> Film Blockade. Movie Blockade. Media and blockade. Perfectly, and would you, if you perfectly did the opening, legal blockade? Yeah, if you did the opening voiceover, how would you do it? <laughs> no, not let's right. not go there. Oh yeah, perfectly legal blockade. The show. <laughs> All right, let's keep going here. Next up, uh, Mars Audio. Thanks for the suggestion, by the way, Stubble. Mars Audio writes. I'm starting to buy some more digital movies than physical. When we purchase digital movies, do we own? Do we own that version like HD, 4K, Dolby? Can it upgrade? 
That's a really good question. I can think you some people it? have when they offer a new version of a film you've bought, you can get the upgrade. I do remember that happening. I yeah. don't know if that's a normal thing, but I do remember that happening. Yeah, I don't know if it is normal either. But See, here's the funny thing, though, and this goes back to part of the discussion. Every single digital movie I've ever got, I still have. Every single one. I can't say the same of every single physical media copy thing I've bought because it gets lost, it gets borrowed, it gets forgotten in which box, it, when you move, blah, blah, blah. It just happens. I, I don't even think, like, I've lost many movies over the years. I still have all the ones I have in my digital You've collection. You've also lost so many other things. I've lost many things. Though. A couple of hot toys, maybe. <laughs> no, no, the hot toys are still in my shed. The hot what toys are in my the shed. You scale say. Iron Man that was the collider. That... Oh, unless you took them, because you've got the no, combination no, of my shed. Saying. Listen, if my hot toys aren't in my shed, you're the only other person who's got the combination of the lock for it. I'll know exactly where to look. I would never take your Jarrell hot toy. <laughs> Where's that quarter scale Iron Man that we opened that we did? That one I left with Collider. God damn. I can't Even though it was given to me, I left it. A Man, collider. I can't believe you had that Darth Maul. <laughs> oh, the one I traded for the zip drive? <laughs> what? Yeah. Do any of you guys remember zip drive? Let of me course. see if I can find it here. You traded a Darth Maul hot toy for a zip I drive? I know. That's like one of you my... You did that? I want... That Darth Maul hot toy so bad. They just came out with a new one. Yeah, but it's like still at the same price as all the other hot toys. I have so, a Darth Maul and a Sith Speeder hot toy. That's cool. I don't know if you guys remember this, but there was this thing called, there was this format called Zip Drives. Yeah. It was incredible because at the time there was floppy disks that held like one meg. And then Zip Drives came that held a hundred megs. And then the second version of it came out and had 250 megs. And it was that cool blue, the blue you had to put in the blue drive. Wait, you yeah. traded Darth Maul for this? And it would click. So what happened was, <laughs> but they're also pretty expensive. Now, remember, I was working in, in, in tech at the time. And I had, now, it wasn't Hot Toy. At least I don't know if it was a Hot Toy. But it was, it was an expensive big, it might have, I don't know if Hot Toy was even around back then. But it was an expensive big. Hot toy's been around for 17 years. It, it might have been a hot toy. It was a beautiful, big uh, Darth Maul, but I really needed a zip drive. And uh, and it, they were hard to get when they first came out. And I remember this dude said, oh, I'll trade you the zip drive and, and uh, three discs or something for your Darth Maul. I was like, sure. I kind of regret that decision now. Kind of. But uh, yeah, yeah, I kind, kind of regret that decision now. But hey, it was a you zip know, drive. You know how much that hot toy would probably be worth now compared to your zip drive? Do you know what the zip drive is worth now? Zero. Like a, like a, a nickel, maybe? All right. Next up, uh, Jasmine Jones writes, uh, part one, I saw that Robbie Adele is joining The Witcher. You, you mean Robbie Amell, uh, cousin of Stephen Amell, the guy who plays the Green Arrow. I saw that Robbie Amell is joining The Witcher Season 3. For people who enjoy the show, I like him as an actor more than Stephen Amell, but maybe I'm biased because I watched more of his stuff. Uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to find her part two. You know, so if we come across it, we'll come across it there. Yeah, listen, Robbie Amell's been doing... When he first got get started going, he was just Stephen Amell's cousin. But he's done some good stuff, including a show he's got on Amazon that my wife loves. I can't remember the name of it, but it's the one where... In a, it, it pretends you're in the world where if you're dying, you can transfer your t consciousness oh, yeah, into like a digital upload. world. It's called Upgrade. Upgrade. Is no, upgrade. no, no, it's not, no, it's upgrade. not upgrade. I think you're right. I think it was called Upgrade. Upgrade is the Lee Wan L movie. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's called Upload. And I've seen a few episodes of that. You know what? Robbie Amell's really good in it. And uh, yeah, they just announced that he's going to be in The Witcher Season 3. I have no idea in what role or how he's going to play it, but I am, I'm really looking forward to seeing him doing that. All right. Let's see, where are we at here? That was Jasmine there, right? Next up, uh, Essa uh, Kadri writes, if the D&D movie is like the community episode, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, I'm going to be so happy. With the game night directors on this, I really hope I'm right. Oh, that's the other, yeah, that's the other reason I'm really excited about this, because the game night directors are on it. I think this is going to be great. I really do. I love Dungeons and Dragons. I love Chris Pine. I like these directors. This is going to be the movie that redeems the Dungeons and Dragons movie. At least I really hope it does. All right, I'm with you, Asa. All right, Murray Reich writes, I saw Ambulance, and all I got to say 
uh, is it's not a great movie. I agree. <laughs> Terrible dialogue. Yep. Uh, so much shaky cam and weird camera angles, but I will say the action is great. So overall, I had a fun time. Hey, listen, at the end of the day, what more can you ask for? You, you go to the movie theater, you hope to have a good time. And if you had a good time, that's the bottom line. It's all that matters. For me personally, there was too much bad things that prevented me from having walked out to go, I had a good time. I, I, I didn't have a great time. Again, I didn't hate the movie, but I'm glad you enjoyed yourself, Murray, um, because it has its moments. It really does. It, it's a movie that has its moments. I really like the performance in it from both Yaya and Jake. I thought they were great in it. Um, it's just you can only get so many screeching tires, hard left turns for so long. Eventually, it's diminishing returns. It's like, okay, You've done that five times in this movie already. I'm kind of over it. But, hey, listen, Aaron liked it. You liked it. And that's all that really matters, Murray. Thanks for writing that in, dude. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Murray's been like one of our longest time viewers. Like, Murray's been around a long time watching our show. Thanks for that, Murray. All right. Um, and we already had uh, the seconds from Disaster. A. Marcellus writes, Amy Henning, the creator of the Uncharted series, is making a new Star Wars game promising a narrative-driven action-adventure game. Yeah, I saw the news of that drop the other day, but nothing about it. Like, not a single thing about it. I mean, it. I would love to see an, a Star Wars game like like Uncharted that has that gameplay and that level of creativity in terms of characters and, and interplay, because that's one of the things that made Uncharted so great with the characters. Yeah. Again, the, the only reason scenes. we didn't cover this is because, again, there was literally no information. So I need something to talk about if we're going to bring it up. But that was exciting to hear, Aaron Marcel. Thanks for reminding us of that. All right. My Comic Planet writes, Nicolas Cage recently revealed that he turned down roles for Lord of the Rings and The Matrix. Did you guys know this? Cage would have been badass in The Matrix. I had no idea. I didn't either. Why do you look? I mean, this goes on top of the other thing that Sean Connery turned down. Sean Connery turned down Gandalf. They offered it to him straight up. We want you as Gandalf. And he turned it down because he wanted to do the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. But uh, I had no idea they offered Nick Cage a role in Lord of the Rings. It's hard to imagine him being in Lord of the Rings. In Lord of the Rings or Matrix? Both. Yeah, that's... I, I, I could see him in the Matrix. I don't know that I could see him in but Lord of the Rings. But I think both of them... I mean, it's a risk. You know, Sean Connery probably didn't fancy himself as a wizard you know, no. whereas Nicolas Cage, I could see him being in it, but Sean Connery is like, and League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, based on Alan Moore, one of the great British comic writers' works, and it's all liter Victorian era literature characters. At least it was supposed to be. If you follow the book, the comic, they had to add a bunch of, you know, Americans in it to make it more palatable to us. All right, next up, we've got uh, Lucky BX who writes. Hey, crew, I watched Endgame for the gazillionth time. One of the best parts of the films are Rocket's interactions with the Avengers. So underrated. I love Rocket in the MCU. Oh, he's great. He's such a unique character. One of my favorite moments, as a matter of fact, in the whole MCU was when Drax is describing his loss and the death of his daughter and his wife and blah, blah. And then Rocket, boo-hoo, my family's dead. I'm like, oh, my God. And the reaction from Groot when he does like, oh, like it. And to me, that's a truly actually that goes rockets in a couple of my all time favorite moments, too, because one of the other best moments in MCU history to me is Rocket and Thor when Thor is doing the whole uh, then what else do I have to lose speech like and that has got right. I love Rocket, of course, played by James Gunn's brother, voiced by Bradley Cooper. Um, it's a it's a fantastic character. I love it. Lucky. All right. Next up, Sam Fisher writes. Uh, if you want to know what the hell is happening in Thor Love and Thunder, just read all of Jason Aaron's <clears throat> Thor run from 2012 to 2019. Maybe the best Thor run. But therein lies the problem, Sam, right? Marvel rarely. No, no, I won't say rarely. I'll say ever. Ever just directly takes from the comics and just it's, does they're that. They're inspired by. It's inspired by. Yeah, yeah. I think you'll probably get, maybe get some ideas from that run, but... Never, never underestimate the fact that Kevin Feige chooses parts from those comic stories and then builds things around them that are different. Yeah. Like, like they take they take the good character bits, character moments, or plot points, and extrapolate on them. Like you know, like I would say about Avengers Disassembled, I think there's a lot of what Doc, Doctor Strange says was taken right out of that into Multiverse of Madness. Is it exactly like? Avengers disassembled no but there are certain beats that are going to be from that that I think are going to work great 
All right, we keep going on here. Next up, we've got Suthius who writes, All Media Everywhere, All at Once, new show name. No, probably not. There's a little bit of a long title over there, but thank you for the creativity, Suthius. Elizabeth writes, So my last question from yesterday turned into mayhem. John trying to make sure that I might not... Uh, I, that I might be hot made me cr made me cackle. Don't worry, I'm an average disabled woman with sass and wits. I I remember something about that. Oh yeah, we're talking because we're not talking about the Elizabeth in the question. We're talking about uh, Rob's Elizabeth. Oh, we don't want to be um, insulting anybody anywhere or anything like that. Well, thank you for the follow up, Elizabeth. We appreciate that. Remember, John, and remember, Elizabeth. Nobody is just average. In the cosmic infinitude of the universe, there's only one of you, which makes you one of the most valuable commodities in the universe itself. Think about that. Infinitude is a word that does not get used enough. Anyway, thank you for that, Elizabeth. We appreciate that a lot. All right. Al Renshaw writes, if Hercules is in Thor 4, over under 40%, we get a spinoff show slash movie of Hercules. Well, here's the problem, Al. That's an if built on an if. If. Hercules in this movie could blah blah. That's hard to say. At first, I don't even think Hercules is going to be in the movie. I mean, probably not. Well, I mean, we, we we may get actor five standing there is Hercules. Okay, but I mean, I don't think I don't think Hercules is going to be a meaningful character in the movie. So I don't I, I can't even give an over under on if Hercules is in the movie, could they do a show? I, so I, I, just I mean, then you'd have that. to go if Hercules is in the movie and if the actor who plays him does a really great job and becomes a fan favorite, and if everyone loves him, then maybe he could be given a show. Yeah, maybe. But no, don't we, forget, Hercules is a character in the in the I, Marvel comics. I, I know. And he's an Avenger, too. So uh, we it could happen. But as far as we know now, there is no Hercules in the movie. All right. All right. Next up, we've got Chef Rigo. And Chef Rigo when writes in. When are we in, going to Shogun, dude? We gotta go, well, it'll have to be after Vegas, obviously. Yeah, no, but it, I really want to go. we got to get over there. Uh, Chef Rigo writes, I'm bored at work. Here's a super chat. <laughs> Thank you, Seth. <laughs> and we will come in and visit you at work soon. Wait, does that, mean that, is that mean if I ran to lunch there, I could maybe get Chef Rigo as Probably my chef? Probably be able to chef? catch him there at lunch. Can, you do, can, can one person go to that place? Yeah, of course. Sure. They're yeah. not going to turn your way. Yeah, it's just like, you know, just be real weird. Because the other thing, it's not just the... Uh, the, what do they call when you sit at the, the table where they cook it? Um, oh, yeah. I can't remember the name of that. But it's not just that. They have the other side of the restaurant that's more traditional. Is just go and sit oh. down at the table, and they bring you your well, food restaurant. Then. So Today's a bad day. But, there's uh, that. All right. I'm going to do uh, that. Jack Black. Oh, Benny, Benny Hanna. But that's not the name of the style. Benny Hanna does it. Hibachi. Thank you, movie Moxie Oswald. Moxie Oswald. Right. It's Hibachi. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up, Blackjack Hooligan writes, Rob, what do you think of S. Craig Zoller's filmography? Bone Tomahawk, Dude, Brawl in Cell Block 99. And Dragged Across Concrete. I'm a fan. I, I love all three of those movies. Bone Tomahawk is awesome. All you, Bone Tomahawk is one of those movies where all you got to say is <clears throat> the scene. Dude. As soon as you say the scene, anybody who's seen the movie knows exactly what. No, you're I'm a about. huge. I mean, talk about a, a powerhouse of, of, of those movies are definitely not for everyone's taste, but they're brutal. They're in your face. They're well acted. They have great actors in them. I love them. Love them. I actually have all three on Blu-ray. All right. Uh, of course. You Would do. you be surprised by that? Not at all. Uh, Zach Marcello writes. Uh, oh, just sends in a super chat to be supportive. Thank you, Zach. Attack of the Mushi writes, any classic recommendations? I dig my man Godfrey. Ooh, good core. If you like my man, my man Godfrey's great. Watch watch Sunset Boulevard and All About Eve. Two very different movies. All About Eve is about the theater, but Sunset Boulevard's great, and or Double Indemnity. But my man Godfrey's more of a fun, mirth-filled movie. Watch, watch Some Like It Hot. What's the Philadelphia story? I was about to say the Philadelphia story. Hepburn and I, I mean so good. That's that's a great one to do. Um obviously then you got your I mean Cool Hand Luke. It depends how far back you want and to go the with the Thin classics. Man series. Yeah, if you it depends. You want to go 30s, 40s, 50s? All right. Next up, we've got uh, Jesse, who writes, one of two. We'll see if we can find your second part. Uh, hi, John and crew. Hope your day is going good so far. It is going good. Thank you so much. I like the Alien versus Predator films, despite what critics uh, and fans think. And... Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, did you know Fox had been tossing around the idea of doing a third film for years and one writer's pitch would have featured the return of the Colonial Marines? Thoughts. 
I, I listen to me. It's like Superman talking to Batman. It's dead. Bury it. Um, I, I mean the alien predators movie, look, all film is subjective. That means every movie that you think is horrible. Somebody likes every movie that you think is the greatest thing ever. Somebody dislikes. And if you like those movies, that's awesome. I, I think it's really good to have just let it go. It, it, it was at this point you were just it was just being run into the ground and nobody was interested in it anymore I, I, obviously some people were but hyperbole but i think it was good that it was gone i don't know rob what do you think do you think they should have taken a swing look man if they were going to do another one I, i've always said in the beginning of alien versus predator requiem we see the predator home world and we saw see this poor predator who has to go fix a problem i want to see a day in the life of predators on their home in their hometown all right what do they do for fun Next up, Patrick Durling writes, thanks for keeping me entertained every day, crew. Well, thank you, Patrick, and thanks for being here and giving us the honor and privilege of being here to entertain you. So thanks for that, man. All right, Wraith X7 writes, hey, guys, do you think that either Amazon or Apple will buy Netflix? No, listen. <laughs> Everybody is so reactionary. I mean, yes, this <clears throat> was a catastrophic day for Netflix. Make no mistake about it. It totally was. But they still have over... They are still by far the biggest streaming service. Yeah. They dwarf, I mean, not in terms of what's in their bank accounts, but they dwarf Apple Plus. They dwarf Disney Plus. They have like way more subscribers than they, they make three billion a month of revenue. Let's let's not get too thinking about well, who's gonna buy them? I mean, so like let's let's pump the brakes on that just a little bit for now, right? Just for now. All right. Uh, Dennis Williams writes and sends like a twenty dollars super chat. Thank you, Dennis, for so that support, man. Dennis writes, "Hey, John and gang, in Moon Knight, I think the directors are throwing us a curveball, and the third alter is not Jake, but instead Bushman and a darker side of Mark to offset his lighter side in Stephen." Well, here's the thing, Dennis. It can't be a curveball because ninety nine point eight percent of the people watching Moon Knight <laughs> have never heard of Jake. So that's not a curveball. Or Bushman. Or Bushman. So it's not a curveball. But I do think it's a third personality. Yeah, but the Bushman's a separate character. Bushman was Mark Spector's ball leader, a, a part of the mercenary group when they plundered, when they originally found Khonshu. But they, but in the show, they could say that's a third personality. Could They could. So, but I mean, I think either way, it's a third personality, I think. But who it is and what it is, I don't know. We'll find out. But, I mean, look, clearly they set it up that there is a third personality. Somebody killed those guys, and it wasn't Mark. And Mark's like, Stephen, what did you do? And Stephen's like, I didn't do it. Somebody, in, I mean, that body did it. So there has to be that personality. I think that third sarcophagi, I think that was definitely pointing us towards a third personality, where it's Jake Bushman, somebody else that they make up entirely. Who knows? We'll find out. All right, next up. Tim Platt writes, Alexander the Great uh, is Alexander the Great Eight is the avatar of the Egyptian god of goal scoring. Hashtag Gretzky watch. <laughs> of course, Wayne Gretzky's nickname was the Great One or the Great Gretzky. Uh, I love that little turn that Alexander the Great was the avatar of Amit. Yep. That was like, what, now was that something that was in the comics? Uh, you know what? I don't remember that, but that doesn't mean that, you know, it could be. I mean, I that's a really interesting thing. All right. Uh, next that. up, we've got Diego Higueras, who writes. Um, oh, wait a second. Did we get to part three of Seconds from Disaster? Yes, I think we did. Okay. Uh, Diego writes, Black Adam now will dominate October box office. I mean, it better. It damn well better. I mean, they, I hope to see more footage from that. I mean, I that well, and Shazam. We are deaf. Well, I can't remember when Shazam's coming. Because then they move Shazam into this year. Shazam did get moved up. So when does Black Adam come out? I I made they might have pushed. Black Adam Black Adam comes out in October, right? So I I just can't remember when Ray, can you look up when does Shazam, what's Shazam's release date? Mm -hmm. See if you can get that for us. But yeah, it's got no excuse not to dominate. I mean, if it now if it, if it doesn't do well, it's got no excuse. Like nothing can back it up now at this point as to why it didn't make that money. All right. Uh next up, we got uh, Nicholas, who writes, do you think Leslie Nope should be in England? Uh, do you not think that, or do you not think that, A, not, I'll be honest, you have no idea what you're asking, Nicholas. I'm sorry about that. All right, Sam Fisher writes, uh, you're right, Rob. When they announced this movie, Pete Doctor said Buzz was conceived as merch from a movie. Lightyear is that movie. 
Interesting. Okay. I'm. Did Pete say that? I don't know. I, I thought, mean, but I thought I heard another Disney executive say something completely different. I don't know. Sam may be right about that. That's very I'm not, meta. I'm not really cu- clear. Expected December 16th, 2022. For Shazam? Yeah. Okay, so we listen, if it is, we're definitely going to get footage of both Black Adam. We're yeah. definitely going to get Black Adam footage. And maybe Shazam as well. All right. Next up. Um, oh, Sin Vendetta Part 2. I don't think we got to his Part 2. Then the Lord of the Rings trilogy documentaries. Then the Hobbit trilogy documentaries. My absolute favorite way to watch the series. So he watches the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. Then he watches the documentary stuff on it. They make awesome documentaries. Not only the Hobbit documentaries. I didn't work on those, but they're really good. And not only that, but he said the extended versions of each movie. Remember? That's the same guy that said yeah. he watches it during yeah. the weekend. Yeah. That's yep. not enough time on the weekend, I don't think. Especially no, 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 the weekend was the other day. Somebody said that on the weekend. I think he just oh. he makes this. Return of the King, thing. the extended version is four hours long. You'd uh, love aren't, it. Aren't the other two four hours long as well? No, they're not that. And then long with long. the special features, it would be three weeks long, right? Well, the special features are 10 hours long on each one of those discs. <laughs> Crazy. 14 hours of entertainment. And if you listen to the... Uh, audio commentaries there's four audio commentaries on each lord of the rings disc okay next up we got uh stefan delin routers who writes uh did you ever play a DD planescape campaign no i didn't i got to know and love it through the pc game planescape torment hoping a revival of that setting honestly when i played DD, we never played any of the pre-made campaigns we always had whoever our dm was always made up the campaigns themselves and yeah. we just went that way so it was very very rare that we played any of that stuff so and, we didn't but the games were always great and i ruined every single campaign you do not you make it fun no remember that You're one barbarian? remember that yeah but remember that one where even Anne was dm she's like you i totally didn't even think that you would do that like now i don't yes but you didn't ruin the game ray figured out something that actually accomplished something that our dm my wife at the time didn't think we'd even be able to do yeah and it kind of threw things off it was a dragon that yeah, well, was supposed dragon, to come back right. later and i said let's wrap i'm gonna throw this rope around we this weren't tree supposed to be able to and bring it dragon. down and we killed it with my idea we killed and we weren't it. supposed to be able to do like she assumed we would either lose run whatever but then we beat the dragon because of something ray came up with it was a great moment i remember that night all right let's see joel uh, Rolston writes, Netflix stock is available. Time to invest that tax refund. Be careful, though, guys, because like I said, there are a lot of industry insiders are saying it's going to, like we talked in the story, that are predicting it's going to drop another 50%. So I'm not saying it will. I'm not giving you stock advice. I'm just saying be careful about going, uh, it's time to invest all my money in this because there are some experts out there who you're saying it's going to drop even further. Just be very, very cautious. All right. Andy writes, Here's a new name for your show uh, you could use. The Real 2. Uh, the Even Realer. <laughs> I dare you to say that's not awesome. Uh, it's not awesome. Uh, but it's it's a creative... Listen, Andy, I'll say this. I haven't come up with a better one. So so there's that. Your idea is as good as any of the ones I've come up with. All right. Next up. James L.H. writes, Hey, John, with Crow and Bale in Thor, I'm due a rewatch of 310 to Yuma. Yes, Rob, I'll be watching it on Blu-ray. And yes, John, Ben Foster is excellent in it. One of the most underrated, criminally underrated movies of all time. I put it in the top 10 of the most underrated films of all time. Is 310 to Yuma. It's in my top three of my favorite westerns ever made. Ben Foster is amazing in it. You got Christian Bale, Russell Crowe. It's a fabulous movie. I'm glad you appreciate it, James. All right, Suthius watch. Uh, Suthius writes, you know, Mark and Steven could be the fission of one individual who has qualities of both we've seen that trope played out before yeah. though, right where like two personalities i mean that's the basic idea behind the dark crystal in many ways but i mean could they go i mean that's not something that's in the comics but is that is that i a mean way they, they could, could i go? mean remember stephen grant is a persona that mark specter creates stephen grant and jake lockley so you never know i mean i don't know how they're going to do it I, I i'm going to be very curious to see where where it all lands all right next up we got Dave XP who writes, just showing my support. Love the show. It's great company while I work. Well, thank you so much for that, Dave XP, who's also been around our channel for a very long time. Thank you for being here. Thank you for letting us accompany you during your day. And thanks for being a part of our community, man. We appreciate that, dude. All right. My Comic Planet writes, uh, saw first look at Chris Hemsworth, uh, Miles Teller in Joseph Kaczynski's Spiderhead movie. Looks very interesting. I, I remember we talked about that movie 
when it was first kind of announced. Yeah. I haven't I, seen it. Have you seen the stuff he's talking about? I haven't from it at all. But, hey, if Joseph Kaczynski is going to have a good year this year, then. Yeah, he is. He already really is. That's going to be interesting. Thanks for that, man. Maybe we'll talk Look, about I that Look, I watched Oblivion tomorrow. the other day again, uh, and I, I like that movie. I'm not big on Oblivion. I, I like really, Oblivion. I, I watched it, and I liked it again. Tom Cruise, right? It yeah. grows, grows on you. Yeah, I like it. Are we it. an effective team? Yes, we are an effective team. <laughs> All right. Next up, we got Blue Rock, who sends in a $20 super chat. Thank you, Blue Rock. And Blue Rock, Rock writes, loved movie club on fellowship thank you man glad you enjoyed it rob you stated once you had extended interview footage with christopher lee i'm an incredible fan of his and british horror how many hot toys do i need to buy you to see this footage i'm gonna guess you probably don't even have the i don't own anymore. the footage yeah all, all of the footage uh for lord of the rings was turned over by us i believe i don't even think michael pellerin has the footage and i did send part of that interview to lucasfilm once where he talks about um peter cushing which was hilarious, and I I thought you've got to put this story on the on the attack. Well, they of the were real disc. life best friends, Peter Cushing and yeah. Christopher Lee. And just quickly, and how many movies did they appear in together? Uh, oh, a lot. They did like a lot of hammer, of hammer horror yeah. films, and I mean, I could, just quickly, Christopher Lee said, "You know, I'm in the new Star Wars movie." When I was interviewing, <laughs> I remember him, that. Yeah, you know, and and he goes, "My friend Peter Cushing was in the first Star Wars movie," and after I saw the film, I said, "Peter, Peter." You were just terrible to that princess, just terrible. <laughs> and and by the way, and, and and by the way, what is a grand moth anyway? <laughs> and which I laughed. And I said, well, Mr. Lee, if 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 Peter Cushing were alive today and he could go see Attack of the Clones and see you in a Star Wars movie, and he called you afterwards, what would he say to you? And P he, Christopher Lee, thought about it. And he said. Well, I suppose he'd want to know what the Dooku was now, wouldn't he? <laughs> and that was, I mean, I was hilarious. He was hilarious. Oh, man, the footage you must have from that. So that oh, it's amazing. All uh, right. That, uh, yeah. Bailey Fuller writes. By the way, thanks for saying that in Blue Rock. Bailey Fuller writes. I've never seen Jurassic Park or Top Gun, but excited for the new film. Dude, I'm nothing but envious. You get to watch those movies for the first time. Absolutely go and get caught up on those before you watch the new ones, my friend. All right, Toshi Victor writes, Warner Brothers, we don't talk about Ezra. No, 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 we don't talk about Ezra. The whole shh philosophy. Again, I have a feeling David Zaslav's not going to suffer that. I don't think D David Zaslav is going to put up with that. I think something's going to happen what and when i don't know but i guarantee you there are things in motion i guarantee you there are things in motion all right mike joyce writes now i've seen everything ray a grunt hijacked a warthog what does that mean halo baby oh, a halo reference okay yes oh my <laughs> god i'm just like thinking of all the action in my head just this whole time we've been sitting here i just like i need to rewatch that whole scene again such mm -hmm. good stuff mm -hmm. for uh anyone who's been so following. i'm two episodes behind now so i gotta watch both of those probably later tonight after i get back from the northman which i'm gonna go see watch a little bit later all right next up jesse writes oh this is part two of, of jesse's all right jesse's part two is did you know fox had been tossing around the idea of doing a third film for oh no no we did get that right yes we did get that one from jesse okay uh andy writes one day, Star Wars will have uh, new movies, and they will replace the opening crawl with Nicole Kidman telling the audience to watch these <laughs> Star Wars films. <laughs> you know, there's a new Star Wars movie coming out. Yes, Nicole, we're here. We're here. We know Nicole. Now, now I can just... Heartbreak feels good in a place Someone like this, and Vader's going to go, no! Someone brought up if Nicole Kidman will show up at uh, CinemaCon with Somehow. a new promo ad. Oh, God. Oh, God. I wouldn't doubt. I mean, she's been there. I've seen her. At Maybe Cinema she'll come out on stage and say, you know, NATO, Cinema heartbreak Con. feels good <laughs> in a place like this. You know, NATO, you should go to CinemaCon. Uh, We're here. Uh, you uh, should really think about going to CinemaCon. <laughs> anyway, all right. Next up, uh, Sam Fisher writes, uh, episode four, spoilers without count context. Why are you hitting yourself? Rock climbing therapy tongues. Oh, episode four of Moon Knight. Okay, I'm like, Star Wars Episode Four. What, what are we talking about? That? Okay, there you go. Yes. By the way, that scene with the... I, first of all, all I could think about... Tell me guys in the live chat if I'm the only one who's thinking this. But when that creature comes out, I thought, well, this is right out of The Last of Us. Because I was a... I thought, that's the clickers. It's a clicker of this shared cinematic universe. Come on, I couldn't have been the only one thinking that when that happened. All right. Uh, next up, Murray Reich writes... 
Also, saw Morbius, and it was meh. The dialogue and the CGI on the characters were terrible. Maybe. Worst of all, it's the it was the end credits scene. Um, first one was okay, whatever, but the second one made no sense. No, I, listen, Murray, we it's one of those things where it really is as ridiculous as it sounded. Yeah. Like when I, there are people who saw it before I did, and I said it's the dumbest, stupidest end credit scene ever. I'm like, okay, it's probably bad, but everybody's probably exaggerating it. And then I saw it, and I thought, nope. Nope, that's exactly what it is. This is the dumbest, no sense, should absolutely not have been in this movie post credit scene. One of the worst things I've ever seen, Murray. As far as the post credit scene goes, worst thing I've ever seen. You're dead on right about that. All right, Hayden Wilson writes, I would have loved to have been, uh, uh, I would have loved to have been in a friend group with y'all in high school. I don't know, I was, here's the thing about me. On the show, I'm very extrovert. When I'm on stage in front of 6,000 people, I'm very extrovert. Like, I'm very comfortable in that environment. But I'm actually really, truly introverted. Like, I I, I don't know that I'd be the most fun guy to hang out with. with. Yeah, like, he's, he's not, folks. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kind of well, boring. As far as I'm concerned, you're a part of my friend group right now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right, man. You're, you're in our friend group as we speak. But honestly, I, I in high school, I was I was pretty boring. I really was. And, and I have no regrets about it, but I was kind of introverted, uh, very low key, shy. I was very shy. Rob um, was probably very different. Rob was probably a player. Rob was manscaping back in the day <laughs> all the way up till now. Rob had his playground. If you uh, know high I mean. school was fun. Yeah, yeah, you see. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, but I, I was also pretty focused. I mean, I worked a lot, but I we partied a lot too. But it was you, you. It was I had a lot of fun. I've always had fun, but but and I had. I have to say, I had a really good group of of friends. They were they were a lot of fun, and we always did things together. And it was and, and you know what? The more the merrier. So it, you would have had a good time. All right. <laughs> Next up, uh, Fredo writes. Uh, John, you think Alex the Great can move up, go one five five? I have no idea what that's a reference. Is sports to. reference at all? Alex the Great wrestler. Alex the great. I don't is that know. a hockey is that a player? hockey player? Alex Ovechkin. Well, I mean, there's Alex Ovechkin, but I I don't know. I've one five can five. go up. I I don't know what we're talking about. Sorry about that, man. All right, never lose your nerd rights. Uh, new show names idea, media entertainment pundits, uh, entertainment media pundits, or media talk pundits. Love y'all and, can talk, uh, and can't wait for the new studio. Um, I think, well, people are saying it's Alexander Volkanovsky. Can he move up in weight, I guess? Oh, one that Alexander the Great. Okay, that dude's an animal. At some point, he's going to have to change weight classes. Because there's no one there. There's nobody there. Listen. There's him and Max Holloway. That's it. The only guy who could possibly beat Max Holloway is, is Alexander the Great. The only guy who has a shot at being Alexander the Great is Max Holloway. And, I, I mean, that's it. And if he beats Max again, because he's beat him twice, both very, very close, He's beaten twice, but if he beats him a third time, there's literally nothing left because everybody else who's the best in that division, Alexander has kicked their asses, <laughs> like straight up whooped them. And so there's nothing less. He's got to look at moving up weight class. He absolutely has to look at working up weight class. All right. Now, now they thank you for, let me just say, are we talking about Alexander Ovechkin? I mean, okay. Well, I, th I thought for a second he was talking about Alexander the Great in Moon Knight. <laughs> That's what I thought I was talking about. It for. Okay. Uh, anyway, as far as the the, the the names, never you lose, you nerd. Uh, I'm not big on the word entertainment being in it, you know, or the word pundits yeah, being yeah. in the title. <clears throat> so to be honest with you. But again, like I said, they're as good as any idea I've come up with. I haven't come up with any ideas either. All right. Uh, next up, the math with the master plan. The man with the master plan writes, have you played poker against your viewer? Yes. Um, I have many, many times uh, played poker where somebody at the table says, just mentions that they watch the show and they mention that. And you that wipe the floor with him. You and come I back and yeah. take all their money. Yeah, he comes back Thanks saying, you, for know watching. This, no. you know this view. <laughs> One of the coolest ones, though, 
Uh, I'm not sure if I can... Hold on a second. Um, uh, oh, now I can't... What's the name of the guy from Seinfeld? George Costanza. The guy who played George Costanza. Jason, Jason Alexander. Alexander. So let me see if I can... Um, I don't know if I can find this picture. I, I hope I can. I probably can't. No, I can't. I can't find it. I, I've shown the picture on this show before, though. But uh, one of the best times ever, I was playing poker at Planet Hollywood in Vegas, which no longer has a poker room as of like last year. Wow. It shut, they shut it down during COVID. But I remember Jason Alexander... And I've showed I've shown the picture of us playing on this on this show before, but Jason Alexander came down and he actually knew who I was. I'm like, wow, that was cool. Let me tell you, he's a damn good poker player. He whipped everybody. He whipped everybody at the table, <laughs> and he was super funny and it was just great. And was it was a lot of fun. It was an awful lot of fun. All right, now uh, let's keep going here. Next up. Losing feels good at a poker table. Like <laughs> Losing this. feels good at a poker table with Jason Alexander. All right, uh, Blake Feely writes, when Steven is talking to the little girl in the first episode of Moon Knight, uh, there is a QR code on the wall. If you scan it, it will give you a copy of Werewolf by Night. Yeah, um, uh, Chris brought that up Yep. on the show the other week. I, th I love it when shows put this little like, kind of Easter egg things there like that that actually have That's some meaning Moon to Moon Knight's them. first appearance. Um, okay. Let's see. Next up, that is Stubble McShave writes, Netflix have lost money for years. Their market value is based on them growing. Uh, when they are not growing, that promise to the shareholders is broken. Yeah, and that's why it's important. But it's not world-ending for Netflix. When you have over 200 million subscribers generating $3 billion of revenue per month, Yes, what happened in the last couple of days is horrible. It's not world ending, though. It's not world ending. So, and the fact is, they can only grow so far. Yes. All, and then there's going to be no one. There's going to be eventually all the subscribers are going to be subscribed to them. There's no more growth. All right. Uh, let's see here. Where are we at next? We are at. But anyway, that's well pointed out, Stubble. All right. Next up, uh, Reese Francis writes. One of my favorite and underrated sci-fi TV series is 12 Monkeys. I heard Rob mention it briefly once on the show. What are his thoughts on the series and the use of time travel? Well, I mean, I love the 12 Monkeys show. Or, sorry, uh, movie. Yeah, the, the show. Was, I know somebody who was in the show, and I never did watch it. Was the it show good? is actually quite good. And Terry Metalis, who is one of the showrunners on, on that, on 12 Monkeys, is the showrunner of this season of Picard. And it deals with time travel, which is one of the reasons I have to say I'm kind of let down by it because I was really expecting great things because I did like Terry Metalis's take on the 12 Monkeys series. I thought it was quite good. All right. Next up. Thanks for writing that in, Reese. Next up, Sam Fisher writes, I love that this episode felt like a mix of The Last Crusade and The Mummy. I'm going to assume he means the Moon Knight episode. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. It felt like an Indiana Jones thing, the, the old kind of adventure thing. I loved it a lot for that reason. Well pointed out, Sam. All right. Milton Vargas writes, for John and Rob, general question, but stance on film festivals. Ever thought of covering any of the main ones? Nah. You know why? Nobody cares. Yeah. Nobody and, cares. I mean, when, when I was at Collider, we used to send people to cover like they went and covered Sundance, went and covered stuff like that. Nobody watched those videos. And you know it what? Crazy. Because those movies, our audience is interested in Star Wars and Marvel and science fiction and, and whatever. And and I love it. I grew up going to independent film festivals. I love independent film festivals. But like you said, John, they're movies most people haven't ever heard of, nor will ever hear of unless they break out like everything everywhere all at once. Now, there, then there's there are festivals like the Toronto International Film Festival yeah. where a lot of the high-profile ones, and I have covered that before, but even then, the views on those videos wasn't much. And when you take in consideration how much money it costs, how much time it takes, and how much effort it takes to do something like that, like traveling there, covering those things, and to get videos that we would literally get more videos if I did a video that called my five favorite things to put on popcorn that video will get more video views than a video well, we spend thousands of dollars to go and cover something. also when you go to film festivals and see them you're seeing hopefully movies sometimes that have never been seen by anybody before so yes. no one's ever heard of them so the best movie at a film festival might not attract any viewers because they don't know what it is but i will say this i love going to film festivals dude i love uh, 
They Crazy. are so much fun. You know what was the best party film festival I ever, besides the Toronto International Film Festival, um, was San Diego International Film Festival. Never got the bigger bigger movies, but it, their parties every night were Do you know crazy what movie good. played there last year? Did uh, Tango Shalom? Shalom? Do you know that was the first place my movie, uh, Prince of Peace, God of War, played? Prince of Peace, God of War had its debut at the San Diego. Oh, Universal amazing. Film and I'll tell you, my favorite film festival, bar none, in the world is the Sitges Film Festival that is outside of Barcelona, Spain. It is a film festival. Angel Sala, the festival director there, it's dedicated to science fiction, fantasy, and horror films. And it's at this old, it's on the Mediterranean. It's amazing. You've got Barcelona, and they even had they even had sponsored by Jack Daniels, they had a zombie walk. Oh, and that's they had so cool. Thousands of people as zombies walking through the middle of this ancient city is amazing. It's amazing. All right. Next up, Mr. Holbrook writes, uh, would you all consider doing a movie club on Super Troopers? No. Uh, and what did you all think about uh, about He Needs Love, Death, and Robots trailer? I never watched the, the first season. I love the thing first of season. It. Yeah, I just never got I never got into it. So I, I haven't even seen the trailer. There's a trailer for a new season. Have I have seen not it? seen the trailer for the second season, but the first season I really liked. But it was pretty, you know, it, it, very wildly in, it, differing in tone. But I liked it a lot. Yeah, I never did watch it. And as far as doing a movie club on Super Troopers, no. I No, no, no. He meant Starship Troopers. He wrote in the chat. Oh. He meant Starship tro Troopers. Oh. Starship Troopers. Yeah. That... Okay, that's a borderline one because while it is not one of the great movies of the past 25 years, it's pretty great. A lot, almost everybody, I don't know many people who haven't seen it. I love it so much. And it's Paul Verhoeven. It's Paul Verhoeven, Neil Patrick Harris. I mean, and it, one of the great unsung redheads ever, Dina Meyer. It's that's borderline, maybe. Maybe someday we'll do Starship Troopers. I was on a panel with the guy. What's the name of the actor who played Rico? Casper. Yeah, yeah, I was on a panel with him once. Nice guy. Yeah, super nice guy. And really his wife's nice great. Guy. The yeah. nicest ever. The nicest <laughs> ever. He's a really nice guy. I always see him at Comic-Con. All right. Uh, next up, we've got Michael uh, Serta who writes, Remember the days of walking into a video rental store? Yep. P.S. Why is it hard to find Craven's Last Hunt hardcover uh, at a decent price that isn't $200 plus? Probably because it's limited. Yeah, and you know what? You know who just moved his? You? Me. You got one? <laughs> I do. You should sell for like $300, man. Nope, because then toy. I wouldn't have it anymore. Well, that's true. <laughs> but no, listen, funny enough, the number one clicked article I ever did on my old website, the movie blog, the number one read article, most clicked article I ever did was how to pick a movie out at Blockbuster with your girlfriend. Wow. And where I proposed the answer to the problem. My here, here's the basic thing of it is because everybody relationships have ended historically in Blockbusters or Rogers video, depending what country you're in. Relations have ended. People go in there and they argue and fight. So I always said this. Here's how you do. This was my article, my recommendation. Go in, and on every even number of time that you go in, you get to pick out five movies, and then she picks one out of the five. The next time you go, she picks out five movies, and you pick one out That's of the five. That's a good idea. I said, you're going to have much. And I got so much love from people saying, John, you saved our relationship. That's when I realized it was my destiny to be a love doctor to the masses. That's not an Maybe issue. Maybe that should be the name of the show. Love that, doctor to the masses. That's not an issue anymore. If they don't like what you're watching, they'll just pull up their phone and start watching. Yeah, they're watching they something <laughs> else right beside you. All right. Uh, next up. Where were we at here? Uh, Tim Platt writes, light your trailer. Buzz Lightyear to Star Command. Come in, Star Command. Why don't they answer? Me. Oh, he said the thing from the Toy Story. Remember, I, we were sitting in this. Ray popped on the trailer before we started the show. Rob was in here, too. And that line came up and said, that's the exact line from Toy Story. They said the thing from the thing. And I was like, yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> it made me so happy. It made me so happy to hear that, Tim. All right. Next up, we got Noah Chant, who writes, John, if you were made the head of DC Studios, what would be your honest ten-year plan and roadmap for DC movies? <laughs> First of all, you're, you're you'd be an idiot to try to think you know what you're doing in ten years. Yeah. That's way too long. Anyway, uh, ten-year plan and roadmap for DC movies. 
Thanks. Uh, also, new show name idea, Robert uh, Meyer Burnett Show. LOL. Just kidding. Love you, Rob. Um, honestly, look, the, what I would do if I were suddenly, if David Zaslav gave me a call, which I'm sure he's just trying to find somebody who has my number right now. Yeah, it's true. I'll, Dave, I'll give him, I'll give it to you him. You toss it over to him? That'd be great. If David Zaslav were to give me a call and say, John, we want to put you in charge of DC, at least tell us what to do. I do think they, they have several options. I think they have several good options. The one I personally would go for, and it's not going to be popular, is Reboot. It's, it's, it's time to scrap everything and start fresh. The great thing about something like the Batman is the Batman is outside of the DCEU, so you don't need to worry about that. But as far as the DCU goes, get Aquaman out in theaters, get Black Adam out, get Shazam out, make your money on them, then have a one-year, two-year hiatus and relaunch your DCU. Continue making outside of the DCU standalone Elseworld kind of movies and stories. But there's too much baggage now. There's just too much baggage and too many people who have already decided they don't like the DCU. So... Uh, and, and listen, I'm not saying that's the, their only path ahead. It's not. They have other options, other options that may work even better. But if it were up to me, I would start from scratch. I don't know, Rob. What do you think? I think it's a good idea. I would, I would rebrand it as the DCCU, the DC Cinematic Universe, and I would do exactly what you just said. I'd start from scratch. You know, I would, I would uh, begin and maybe begin with a, um, a Justice League movie. I, I have been saying that forever. Forever, forever, forever. They should have launched the DCEU with a Justice League movie. And everybody's like, no, you don't understand. That's not the Marvel way. You have to have individual movies first to build up. No, you don't. Guardians of the Galaxy didn't need five individual films to build up to them being the Guardians of the Galaxy. You can come mm -hmm. right out of the gate with a Justice League. Then you could have spun off individual films that do it exactly the opposite well, of Marvel. And if you made a good movie, it would have worked because winning cures Everything. Uh, I mean, look, you, you know what? Everyone knows that Justice League, you don't have to explain who any of these characters are. And you just start. You just introduce a whole new cast of characters. It, it'd be tough to cast a new Justice League movie. But just go and start fresh. Start from scratch. Yeah, I agree. All right. Next up, we got to hurry here because we're way over time already today. Uh, Jedediah Elias. Remember I said earlier, it's like, damn it, I left the Super Chats open for too long, even though they were only open for like two minutes. Uh, Jedediah Elias writes, Anish, uh, I'm not, I'm going to butcher the name. Uh, Anesh Shangant Shanganti should direct Blair Witch Remake. Searching is a, oh, Searching. Is, is that who directed Searching? Love Searching. Searching is a masterful found footage film. He also has experience uh, getting great performances. I'm going to bet they I like Searching. I no. absolutely love searching. Searching, yeah, I thought that was so really good. good. John Cho, Deborah was really, Messing, John Cho. Yeah, it, it was really good. It was just a little quiet movie that kind of came up out of nowhere, and it was great. You it enjoyed was really it. Well done. Too bad. I I I, I texted you the night where I watched it. That's and, right. I and I was that. like, "Have you seen Searching? This movie is really good. I really like it." Yeah, and it was yeah. really good. And John Cho was really good in it. Yeah, and it's well directed. Yeah, it's really very, well, directed. Very well directed. All right. Next up, uh, we've got. Uh, Jasmine Jones, who writes, here's a question. Who do you think is the better actor? I think Robbie is Oh, probably still talking about Robbie Mel, Stephen Amell. I think Robbie is also more well known because uh, think about it. If the main thing we know Stephen from is Arrow, not any of his other projects. Well, that's not true. Um, he's got a show out right now that a lot of people are really liking called Heels. Now, I haven't had a chance to start watching Heels yet because I don't think I have the network that it's on. But I've been written to by many people that really like that show, like a lot. And um, so right, I think personally, Steven is the better actor right now. But Robbie has got a great potential. He's got yeah. huge, huge potential. And it's going to be interesting to see how he does in something like Witcher, Witcher 3. So right now... I will say Steven is the better actor. I don't know, Rob, you got an opinion on that? No, not really, because I haven't seen enough of their work. I like Steven, but I, I haven't seen enough of Robbie to make a comparison. Right. Now, obviously, I am I will always be biased. Yeah. Stephen Amell, this is how cool of a guy he is. He knew my wife was a big fan. Stephen Amell, while shooting Arrow, went to his trailer, still in costume, 
and recorded a happy birthday message to my wife. Like on, on that day, it's like whatever Stephen Amell ever needs from me, he gets. Like I, you've got me loyal for life. So obviously I'm a little bit biased, but, but honestly trying to take my bias out of it. I think Steven is, is a little bit better, but Robbie's got some great potential upside. All right. Thanks for writing that in Jasmine. Uh, let's see here. Alan Ling writes, Hey, John and crew uh, are any and or all of you keeping, keeping up still with the end game on NBC. Curious as to your thoughts for the show. Thanks for all you guys do. So this is the one with Marina uh, Bacaran. Uh, uh, Marina Bacaran. I saw the first two episodes because I think they dropped it with the first two episodes. I really liked it. Same with me. And I forgot all about it until just now. Until just now. <laughs> I just I, I liked it. I haven't kept up with it, but I liked the first. Yeah, two I really liked the first two episodes. So I will go back, but I have not kept up with it. So I'm going to go back and get caught up. I'll go on Peacock and, and yeah. it's an NBC one, right? Yeah. I'll go on to Peacock and get caught up because I really did like the first two episodes. So so no, Alan, haven't kept up, but I plan on keeping up. All right. Let's see. Next up, we've got uh xg writes hey john rewatch the guest with dan sevens one of my favorite underrated Stevens. movies oh that should be dan stevens the guest is great that's one that actually kind of showed off look because look obviously dan got his star pop from downton abbey i mean that, that's that's where everything started the one of the more the what's that beauty and the beast then he got to do beauty and the beast result for that and a number of other things but I remember, man, his death was a totally unexpected death on uh, uh, Downton Abbey. Like, it was like, one of the, like, wait a minute, they killed that character off? But he has been showing that, and the guest is definitely one that's really showed off his chops. There's a great physical media version of it put out by Second Sight in the UK. Just saying. Of course there was. <laughs> all right, and then there's just some Super Chat support coming from, all from Brian Whitney, who sends in, like, a hundred bucks of super chats just to be supportive a 50 a, a five a 20 a 20 another five equaling Jeez, up to 100 Brian. thank you Dude. Brian, for sending in that thanks support, buddy man thank you very much for being a patron of our channel also lord ali just sent one in as well just to be supportive thank you for that lord ali and guys that'll again brian huge thank you to man thank you for that didn't even send in a question just right. wanted to support the show thank you guys so much all right guys that'll do it for today's installment of the John Campy Show, thank you so much, so, so much for being here and making this show part of your day. Big special thank you to all you guys, like Brian, for sending in all those super chats, number one, because you gave us great fun things to talk about, but number two, you supported this channel as you did it, and all of us involved with the John Campy Show, thank you guys so much for your support. And guys, tomorrow is the last episode of the John Campy Show that we will be doing from this room. The next episode of the John Campus Show after tomorrow is going to be from the new offices and studios, so keep your guys' eyes open for that. By the way, just a warning to everybody, again, for those of you who are thinking all these great things about the new studio, it's going to look like shit. It's not going to look good, okay? I'm not getting the new studio because it's going to look amazing. I'm getting the new studio so it'll be practical and allow us to do the things we want to do. It'll eventually look amazing. Yeah, maybe eventually it'll get there, but I have no designer's eyes, so it's going to look like crap. But anyway, uh, great to have you guys here. I want to thank the people sitting in the room with me. Obviously, Robert Meyer Burnett. Where can people find you, Robert? You can find me on Instagram, John. <laughs> I got it. RM Burnett. Find me on Twitter at Burnett RM or find me on my own YouTube channel, the post geek singularity and also ray aura ray how are you doing where uh, can people find you well uh, thanks again brian and at ray aura with a zero and of course you guys can follow me on instagram and on twitter simply at john campia guys that'll do it for us for now thanks so much for being here my name's john campia and until tomorrow my friends bye bye